So I'd like to call to order the Boulder City Council meeting for September 17th, 2019. Um, just a reminder, sign up for open comment is now closed uh, in accordance with our uh, procedures. And for people who are speaking at um, open comment next, um, just a reminder that uh, <clears throat> you can't speak on anything that is going to be an agenda item and the only agenda item tonight is a transportation master plan. So we will start with a 15 minute update on our municipal court from Judge Cook. Let me call roll first. Please. Sure. Council member Brockett. Present. Carlisle. Here. Jones. Morzell. Nagel. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. We have a quorum. All right, I guess that's my signal that I can go ahead. Um, I'm gonna talk to you tonight about um, uh, our community court initiative um, because that's something that's been underway since earlier this year and I wanted to share with you all the exciting um, news about it. So first of all, uh, uh, a learning curve about community courts. Um, I was first introduced to this concept by Tom Carr who um, helped uh, start the community court that existed in Seattle for many years. Um, one of the things he pointed me to was the Community Justice Summit which happens every couple of years and is convened by the Center for Court Innovation and so I attended that summit in 2016 and there were several um, judges from community courts around the country there. Um, I stayed in touch with them. Um, this includes Judge Mary Logan from the Spokane Community Court, who I'm, uh, which is a court I'm gonna talk about a little bit more later on. Um, after the summit, I contacted the Center for Court Innovation and I was asking for more information and they pointed me to um, some of their resources. And I thought that a couple of years ago we might actually apply for a grant to become a community court but in communicating with them, we realized that in terms of our state of readiness, we weren't there yet. Um, but they did say, hey, look, we're going to be having technical assistance opportunities in the future. So um, very early this year, um, we applied for um, technical assistance to become a community court, and we were one of three sites around the country that was awarded a technical assistance or TA grant. Um, so this is a no cost grant for us in, in the sense that um, we don't have to pay them for their expertise. They're also not giving us any money, but um, it's great to have the benefit of their wisdom as we look at um, planning and potentially launching a community <coughs> court. Um, the community court program is actually a national program that's funded by the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is part of the US um, government's Department of Justice, so it's a pretty it's a pretty big deal. And in fact, there are um, community courts internationally too, for instance, in Melbourne, Australia, and some other um, places around the world. So you might be wondering what a community court is. So the, the prominent features of community courts are that they are um, achieving offender accountability through alternatives to jail and fines, and they're using a problem-solving approach to the issues that underlie criminal behavior. But most importantly, they are working together with community members in the local community to accomplish this. It isn't just the court um, working on its own, which is um, more or less the model that we have going on right now here in Boulder. Um, you might wonder why we might wanna become community court. Well, um, because it's really produces some of the best results um, in terms of uh, community satisfaction with the outcomes that uh, courts are able to produce with respect to particular um, problems. And you can see those, um, some of those outlined up there. These are the main attributes of community courts. First of all, they practice procedural fairness, and you've heard me talk about that multiple times before. They use alternatives to jail and fines. Um, a big part of community courts is that they facilitate linkages to social services, and um, oftentimes they're doing that on-site um, and co-locating with the court. And finally, um, a big attribute is community engagement. So. Um, here's where we are in our planning process. Um, so far we've cataloged our existing practices. 
We, um, a big part of um, forming a community court is to get feedback from the community about what they think would be helpful. We have different surveys for different sort of subpopulations. So we've been interviewing homeless people when they've been coming to court about kind of what they're s identifying as what would be helpful. But we also have a community survey for community members and we're still accepting feedback. So if anybody wants to go and take that um, survey, it's at that survey, survey monkey link. Um, information went out about that in one of the quarterly newsletters. You may have seen that a few months back. Um, so we're still trying to collate all of that. We're also having some uh, small stakeholder groups. So for instance, um, we convened a group of people from law enforcement from the Boulder Police Department, and we have some other stakeholder um, groups planned as well. Um, we've done some site visits. So a few weeks ago, um, Sandra Giannis, um, who supervises the prosecutors um, and myself, along with one of the prosecutors and our deputy court administrator, went to the New York City area where we visited three different community courts, one in Midtown Manhattan, one in Red Hook, which is in Brooklyn, and one in Newark. And then next week, we're also, that same group is traveling to Spokane, and we're actually really excited about that visit for a few reasons. Um, first of all, the three sites that we visited in the New York City area have Center for Court Innovation staff partnering with them to run their community courts. And that's not a model that will be feasible for us. Whereas Spokane is partnering with their local community um, service providers, and that's probably much more in alignment with what we can hope to achieve here in Boulder. Secondly, although Spokane is about twice the size of Boulder, they have a significant homeless population with very similar issues. They have a university there. Their climate is similar to ours. So we think we can um, learn a lot from how Spokane is um, running their community court that could inform um, what we could do here in Boulder. So um, that's where we are so far in the planning process. The, the boxes below it are things still to be done. So the Center for Court Innovation staff who are um, staffing our uh, technical assistance grant. Two of them are going to be visiting Boulder um, on those states and observing our court and meeting with a lot of our stakeholder partners as well um, so they can understand what we have going on already. And then um, we'll need to develop a plan that's specific to our court and then figure out how we're going to implement. Um, in terms of the uh, catalog of sort of the necessary attributes, um, as I mentioned, we're already practicing for procedural fairness. We're already using alternatives to jail and fines. We are linking people to social services right now, but we're not doing it on site. And that's something that we aspire to. And we're not sure it's realistic, but we're going to explore that. Um, one of the alternatives to that, if you can't do that, is having what they call a warm handoff. We do a lot of that right now. Um, but it would be awesome if we were able to find a way to do it on site. And then the big piece that we're actually lacking in to sort of be denom denominated a community court is the community engagement. So we're looking for, um, po we're exploring possible models for us that will make sense for the Boulder Municipal Court in the city of Boulder. Uh, but that's, so that'll be probably the primary emphasis um, of our planning. And I wanna share with you the- What community um, court does is it really changes the approach considerably. The idea is um, figuring out why someone keeps coming back into the criminal justice system. The total objective of community court and the downtown precinct officers is not only accountability, but help. And that's what we provide at the downtown library every Monday at 10 o'clock. We have almost 30 service providers who are there to help individuals get the services they need to avoid the situation where they're charged for disorderly conduct or pedestrian interference or being drunk in public. It's called procedural justice. If you, if you treat people fairly, if you treat them like human beings, if you treat them with respect, they will get the message you are trying to send to them. But if you treat them like animals, like we treat homeless people, in the greatest nation on earth, you see people under the bridge, living under the bridge. If you treat them like animals, you, you're gonna get animals. So that's a, um, I didn't get to introduce that because it started so quickly, but um, that's Judge Mary Logan um, from the Spokane Community Court, followed by the prosecutor for that court, followed by the public defender for that court. So that's sort of the one minute nutshell 
of what um, community courts, how they tend to operate and what they hope to accomplish. Thank you for that briefing, Judge Cook. Does anybody have any questions? Mary. Yes, thank you for that, Judge Cook. I do have a question regarding um, a comment that you made at the beginning of your presentation, which was um, that the purpose of the community court is to hold offenders accountable. <clears throat> and it seems to me that accountability is something that goes both ways. Um, and so what does the community court um, designation do to hold um, the courts and um, and um, officers and uh, law enforcement accountable as well? Well, it's not a primary purpose of community courts or actually for most courts to hold police officers accountable. That happens in a different forum, okay, unless there's a lawsuit against a police officer. But um, that's not our role in the context of the average criminal case where there's a prosecution filed. Um, what one of the things I didn't say is it's designed to hold them accountable, but also think of accountability in a more expansive and broader way. So um, what we know from decades of doing of holding people accountable by incarcerating them is that it doesn't work and it doesn't change their life circumstances. So the paradigm shift is that you hold them accountable in different ways <clears throat> by making, for instance, community engagement with um, social services part of their sanctions so that they are getting the help that they need that will ultimately um, change their um, criminal behavior. Thank you. And, and to what extent have community courts resulted in changes in the types of services that are offered? So every, one of the interesting things about, that we've learned from doing the community court exploration so far is that each community court is invited to develop its sort of own measures of success. And so everybody's defining that differently. So you can't like look at them holistically and say this is what they've accomplished. Um, what you can do though, and, and so for instance in Spokane, one of the things that they're looking at is um, they're looking at success individual defendant by individual defendant. And did they, have they made some changes that have been beneficial to them? They, um, they might look at trends in overall um, citations of certain types in their community, but they're not looking at individual defendants to see if they did or didn't repeat offend. It's just, do we have sort of a downward trend in open container violations? Um, but they emphasize um, in one of the, they did a webinar for us um, and they emphasize in their webinars is, you know, the small changes, small successes are victories, especially for people like uh, in the homeless population. And we're not limiting our community court just to the homeless population, but um, you have to look at those small successes and, um, and, and recognize that that has, is a result of the engagement of the community court and that's produced change. Because small successes usually then generate a desire to engage further and create larger successes that build on those initial small successes. Thank you. You're welcome. Bob? Thanks, Judge Cook. I'm sorry, you may have mentioned this. What, what do you see your um, time frame for, I know you're doing a lot of due diligence and investigation and understanding how these work. What do you see a, as a potential time frame for launch? So um, our uh, technical assistance grant <coughs> theoretically ends at the end of November of this year, although they did indicate that they could extend um, for a few months beyond that, and probably that's what we'll do. So um, we don't have an actual launch date at this point. Um, I think we'll, you know, hopefully sometime in 2020, and we will be strategic about it because we don't want to launch, for instance, in September of 2020 when we're overwhelmed with um, citations because of the beginning of the academic year. Um, so hopefully it would be er, you know, quite a bit earlier in the year than that. So we'll be strategic about how we do it. But it's going to depend on um, a lot of things coming together um, here locally in terms of what, you know, we're really waiting for their site visit to sort of say this is what we think are some of the attributes that you should really look at when you're implementing. Mm -hmm. Cindy. So Mary, <coughs> excuse me, Mary asked one of my questions, her second one, but uh, you said Spokane has 30 people, service providers. And That's what the video said. And they're about twice the size of this city. Mm -hmm. Are those city persons from within the city or do they, no. I'm wondering if the county would be 
So there are when all kinds of service providers. So there are social services agencies, um, the w mental health services, um, medical services. They actually have one of the people very involved with them is their um, probably their equivalent of our RTD. So transportation. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a broad range, and I don't know all of them. I know some of them from the webinar that we participated in. Um, we'll learn more when we're there um, observing next week. Um, but yeah, it's a variety of people. Just one and stakeholders. It, it sounds like a really exciting program. Thank you for taking it up. Anybody else? Thanks again for right, the briefing, thank you. much appreciated. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I wanna do a short public service announcement before we go on to open comment. I received a call today from a person posing as a sheriff's officer and they knew my name, they knew my address, they took me a long way down the scam and it only ended when I went into the sheriff's office to check and he told me, if you go into the sheriff's office, you will be arrested and I said, I'll take my chances. Um, it turns out four or five other people had been called this morning. So somebody calls you posing as a sheriff's officer who says you have two citations for failure to appear, don't believe them. So with, <laughs> so with that, we'll move on to open comment. Again, just, just comment on anything besides the TMP, the Transportation Master Plan that we're hearing tonight. And if you could tee up, uh, queue up behind the person, the first speaker is Anna Segur, and the second one is Beck Spoon. Uh, thank you, Council. My name is Anna, and tonight I will read a testimony into the record that is one of many that community members have collected in horror as they've researched how Boulder is connected to the immigrants' right crisis that is exploding in our country. This story is an impact statement from an immigrant who is under the care of BI Incorporated, a wholly owned subsidiary of the GEO Group headquartered in Gun Barrel within city limits. This immigrant is in the Intensive Supervision Appearance Program, also known as ISAP. Mm -hmm. What is alarming is how ISAP hides its operations. Advocates and lawyers are not allowed to accompany their friends or clients to an ISAP check-in. When an immigrant brings an advocate with them, the ISAP representative threatens to return them to jail. City Council members have stated that the hiring of Boulder police officers by third parties should not be polit politicized. I say it should. If the third party promotes illegal activities or violates human rights, then the city of Boulder should not be involved. This applies to third parties that promote hate speech or criminalize asylum seekers. Seeking asylum is an international human right. As applying for asylum is legal under US and international law. As such, treating asylum seekers as criminals is unacceptable. Furthermore, the strategy of GEO Group and BI Incorporated to profit from treating asylum seekers as criminals is abhorrent. Please take a stand against the expansion of the profit-hungry prison industry into our immigration system and refuse to provide Boulder Police Department officers to BI Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Bex? And next after Bex will be Nicholas McWhorter. Bex Boone, I'm also with the group concerned about how Boulder is connected to the immigrant rights um, crisis in our country. And I'll also be reading an impact statement from an immigrant who's under BI Inc., under surveillance by BI Inc. Um, and my wish as we read the, these statements is that everyone listening take time to reflect on how our system prior prioritizes the um, safety of some people over the safety of others. So um, the statement is, every time I went to check in with ISAP, my officer told me I had to leave the country and that I couldn't stay. He always asked me how much money I had saved to buy plane tickets. I told him every month that my attorneys had filed an appeal and that I didn't have to leave. He ignored me and laughed and said that I would have to leave. I felt like he was trying to intimidate me. So I hope we think about whose safety we wanna prioritize in our community. And I ask council to explore all the options at its disposal, including a public hearing to fully address the lack of oversight and accountability to co the community. Their program is nationwide, but they operate and train staff right here in Boulder. And what are we prepared to do as a community to protect our neighbors from ongoing undocumented harm? Thank you. Next is Nicholas McWhorter, and after Nicholas is Renee Morgan. 
All right, hello, I'm Nicholas McWhorter. I live at 425 South 41st Street in Boulder. Um, so today I'm gonna to be speaking in support of Ordinance 8340 regarding the regulation of tobacco and nicotine products. Um, so today the city of Boulder will consider the motion to adopt the final eight ordinance 8340. I would just like to briefly point out that according to the CEC, cigarette smoking is responsible for 480,000 deaths per year in the United States and 41,000 deaths are result result resulting from secondhand smoke exposure. Um, on May 10th, 2019, uh, my father died of lung cancer at the age of 61, so this is important to me. Uh, smoking is the leading cause of preventable deaths worldwide, we know that, but thousands of young people start smoking cigarettes every day. Um, so the, the memorandum for the ordinance 8340 points out, among or other things, that in 2018, out of 37 states in the study, Colorado has the highest level of vaping among high school students. In addition, in 2019, states will collect more than $27 billion from to tobacco taxes in settlements in court, but will only spend $655 million in the same year to, to tobacco prevention programs. <coughs> That's less than 2.4%. Right now, not a single state out of the 50 funds tobacco prevention programs at CDC's recommended level. Spending 12% of the $27 billion would fund every state's tobacco control program at CDC's recommended levels. So I think Ordinance 8340 is a step in the right direction. I think a lot more needs to be done, um, obviously, especially to keep young people from using harmful nicotine products. Um, at this time, I don't know what those additional steps would look like. It is a complicated issue, but I hope Boulder passes Ordinance 8340. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Next is Renee, and after Renee will be Jody Radke. Hi, hey everyone. Um, I'm Renee Morgan. I've lived in, um, I lived in Boulder City for about 10 years. I live in Lafayette, been around for about 20, over 20 years. Um, I'm also here to talk about the GEO Group and BI, and um, you're going to hear a lot more impact statements directly from undocumented folks that are too, feel too unsafe to be here, and I mean that alone um, makes a huge statement. Um, so the GEO Group is a private prison and private immigration dis uh, detention center company. So what that means is they're beholden to the shareholders, and actually states get charged if the beds aren't filled. So I mean, I don't even think I have to say much about that, except to, that they are making a profit off incarceration of people, off dehumanization of people. And while the um, GEO prison system is about 15% of private prisons, the immigration detention center is 71. 71% of the immigration de detention centers are run by for-profit companies. That means the states not the city necessarily, but the states are being, are paying if those beds are unfilled, if they are not meeting their obligation with the contract. Um, but that has huge implications for the city because we have people in sanctuary here in Boulder. And so it's not just the incarceration in the beds, it's all of the surveillance and the imprisonment, the mobile, the mobile imprisonment. So the ankle bracelets, all of that, that people are, that are, people are in, um, incarcerated here in Boulder with that. And you know who manufactures that? BI. And BI is a company here in Boulder. And so I just wanna say that like, in 1985, this city said it was a nuclear free zone. Why can't we be a weapons manufacturer free zone? Like why can't we just say no? That like we're not gonna manufacture weapons, we're not gonna manufacture, allow, allow companies in here that are manufacturing dehumanization tools. And at the very least, a public hearing that we can find out what the hell they're doing for the public would be really beneficial. Thank you, Renee. Next is Jody Radke, and after Jody will be Brian Highland. Good evening, my name is Jody Radke. I'm the Regional Director with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. It's nice to be back. Um, a lot has happened since the last time I was here, some of which is unfortunate. We now have 380 confirmed cases of lung illnesses and deaths associated with vaping. The seventh death was confirmed today, unfortunately. Those cases stem from 36 states across the country, now including Colorado and the U.S. Virgin Islands. You may have also noted in the media, President Trump is taking action at the federal level um, with the intent to remove all flavored vaping products, such as the consideration before all of you, within a 30-day timeline, which will include both mint and menthol. The same time last week, Governor Whitmer um, in the state of Michigan became the first state to enact an emergency public health rule, which will institute the same provisions, removing flavored vaping products from the market statewide, including the sale online. 
So as a reminder tonight, I just wanna remind you that these are not approved cessation devices. And I wanna also update you on the use of mint and menthol products with our kids, which was just updated with information last week. So that increased from just over 51% to now six, nearly 64% of kids are using mint and menthol. So hopefully in 20 years when you have new council members sitting in the seats, it won't be um, it won't be testimony they're hearing from folks about a product that helped them switch, but rather the actions you're taking here tonight will create a room and a new narrative around kids who never started. So those standing in favor include public health organizations that you know and trust to be credible. And I just wanted to let you know we stand in partnership with you this evening and your efforts to also do the same to protect Colorado and more specifically Boulder's kids. Thank you so much for your efforts. Yes, thank you. Oh, question? Yes. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for coming out tonight. Yeah. Um, the statistics you mentioned about the increase in, in use of menthol among um, kids, is that, um, is that a nationwide stat and when, what's the source of that? Nationwide survey, it's the most recent data that's been updated for 2019. That survey happens every two years, so the data is just now being released for the 2018 data. So that's who, new. who collects that? Um, that is collected through the CDC at the national level. Great. Thanks, Judy. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you, Judy. Thank you for your partnership. And next is Brian Highland, and after Brian will be Ali Catherine Wild. Hi, my name is Brian Highland. I live in South Boulder. I would like to thank council and staff for their excellent work they've been doing in addressing climate change. I received an email just yesterday about the climate mobilization launch for the public next Thursday to discuss the climate mobilization action plan. I appreciate that you're involving residents so much and also including other systems that affect energy use like land use and financial systems. We are ahead of many other cities on this front, though one area we're not is being a livable city for all income levels. Everything is intertwined and besides being exclusionary, it inhibits our climate goals by forcing people to live far away from where they work. I hope this is being addressed as part of or in conjunction with the action plan. I also applaud the perseverance of council and staff in exploring in public utility and for your advocacy at the state level. The last 10 years have shown that the monopoly utility Excel will vigorously oppose, delay, and block any endeavor that does not benefit their real customers who are their shareholders. This is why we aren't already done with this process and at less expense. If we don't become a public utility, it's a promise of what our future holds, roadblocks every time we want to pursue a benefit to our residents or the environment that doesn't lie in their pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ali Catherine Wild, and after Ali Catherine will be Bruce Norikani. Hi, uh, I'm back again. This is like my fourth time. Hopefully this will be my last. Thanks for receiving me and everyone out well, and thank you for everyone who speaks. My name is Allie Catherine Wild. I live at 311 Pearl at Glen Willow, which is a Boulder Housing Partners property. I'm speaking today as part of the disability community. Many like me have hidden disabilities, such as diabetes, HIV, or learning disabilities. I'm here to talk to City Council to ask, how is Boulder Housing Partners held accountable and to speak directly to the handicapped community to say, please advocate for yourself. I've been speaking with Ann Pastures at the Center for People with Disabilities. Here's my story. Recently, workers from a construction site falsely claimed that I blocked that I blocked them. Later they said that I harassed them. Th this is the construction company today working in an accessible parking spot in our parking lot. Oh my goodness, the parking lot was also blocked and we received no warning about the lack of um, access to parking. Previously workers blocked my little blue car. There are many little problems, there are many little problems that workers create with the moral problems such as taking fruit from public access tree in a community where there's a shortage of food. This is actually a pi another picture of blocking access to our trash and here they are picking the fruit. Okay, so what happened to me is these people made a false claim against me that said that I um, blocked them and that I harassed them. And the hard part is Boulder, ha Boulder Housing Partners didn't believe me when I said um, that's not true. Okay, so instead of going to solutions, um, one of the solutions is to create a temporary accessible spot. I see my time is running out, but what I wanna say to the disability community is if you have a problem with Boulder Housing Partners, advocate for yourself. Get a letter from your physician for a, a reasonable accommodation Get the paperwork in if you can. Boulder Housing Partners might intimidate you and threaten you with eviction. If you are threatened with eviction, um Finish your sentence. If you're threatened with eviction, go to eviction court. Eviction court is often interested in keeping people housed. 
advocate for yourself, go to court. Great, thank you, Ellie Catherine. Thank you for your time. Bruce Nor Norcani and then uh, William Culkin will be afterwards. Thank you, members. Uh, my name is Bruce Norcani, longtime resident of Boulder. Um, in, in 1942, the U.S. government imprisoned 120,000 Japanese Americans. Most of them were U.S. citizens. This included my mother, my father, uh, all of my uncles, all of my aunts. And during this process, they were in prison for four years. They, they lost everything. They lost their houses, their farms, their cars. They were never accused of any crime except being one-sixth Japanese descent. No, no one stood up for them at that time except for the great governor of Colorado, Ralph Carr. And he made a very brave stand uh, as the governor, and he welcomed the Japanese to the state of Colorado. <clears throat> and, but he was a lonely, lonely exception at that time. I I'm here today because I believe all of us must stand up against the, what the U.S. government is doing to immigrants and asylum seekers who have not been accused of any crime, but are being thrown in prisons or detained under um, programs like ISAP, which is maintained by BI Inc. Um, um, uh, so to that end, I would like to read into testimony, a testimony of uh, someone who is under their care but can't speak directly because they are terrified um, that they will be thrown out of the country or deported if they cause any trouble. My ISAP officer would not even return numerous phone calls I made to him after my surgery. My doctor had ordered bed rest for me, but because I could not get to them, now uh, ISAP detainees are required to report to their ISAP case officers, I'm sorry. Um, but because I could not get to him, I had to take pain medication and I had to come in for my check-in even though it was at great risk to my health. Great, thank you. And I could say to you and everyone else uh, on this subject or any other, please email us these statements. <clears throat> so if we don't get the chance to finish, we'll get them by email. Okay, and so we have written that great. we will pass out. Great. Thank you. So thank you, Bruce. Uh, next is William Culkin, and after William is Darren O'Connor. Good evening. My name is William Culkin, 110 Iroquois Drive. I'm a watershed advocate with Boulder Waterkeeper. I'm here tonight to ensure Council's awareness of adverse water quality conditions in Boulder Creek. The creek is a point of focus around which many of our community's favorite activities and events are conducted and is the aquatic heart and soul of Boulder. It appears to flow clean and cold from the mountains into town, but the creek is an impaired stream that since 2003 has exceeded EPA and CDPHE water quality standards for E. coli, an indicator of fecal pollution. No E. coli water quality improvement has been achieved since 2003, and Boulder Waterkeeper has pushed for investigation and mitigation actions by stormwater discharge permit holders such as the City of Boulder, CU, and other stakeholders in an effort to permanently reduce E. coli concentrations. We are not aware if Council has been advised of this water quality problem or the development of a recent E. coli implementation <laughs> plan by the City in June of this year. Boulder Waterkeeper had asked the former director of Public Works for Utilities about the resources needed to manage the implementation plan. The response strongly implied the plan was not a significant policy do document or subject to a formal advisory board <coughs> recommendation and submittal to council for approval, leaving the impression the plan is not a priority for the city. E. coli stream impairment has potential health hazards associated with recreational activities such as Tube to Work Day, whose city sponsor is Parks and Rec. There's no signage about risks uh, of recreating in stretches of the creek that exceed standards for E. coli. Health issues from ingestion of contaminated water, especially in children, include stomach pain, bloody diarrhea, and vomiting. Boulder Waterkeeper urges council to direct staff to place advisory signage at strategic locations along the creek. This is the right thing to do. Boulder Waterkeeper also strongly recommends that Council actively support the reduction of E. coli in Boulder Creek via a review of the City's E. coli implementation plan, implementation plan and that the City's Water Resource Advisory Board provide direct advisory support to City Council. Great. Thank, Thank you for you. your time and service. Hang on a second. We have yeah. a question for you. Cindy. Yep. So I just wondered if you had approached the Water Resources Advisory Board. We were at the meeting last night um, out at 63rd Street. Um, 
and we, uh, so we, yes, we have been in contact with our Water Resources Advisory Board, and um, we are, what we would like them to do is lean on council um, in court, uh, in concert with uh, you becoming more aware, uh, council becoming more aware of this uh, city's uh, E. coli implementa implementation plan, which uh, was issued in June. Thank you for that, and maybe we'll hear something from the city manager after the public comment. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> okay, Darren O'Connor is up, and then after Darren, Patrick Murphy. Hi, Council, Darren O'Connor, 25-year resident of Boulder. I, too, am here to speak about BI Inc. and their impact on immigrants across this country. It's actually impacting approximately 100,000 people who are in the immigration system and are effectively incarcerated every day um, as a result of this company that is located right here in Boulder. Um, we're a sanctuary city, I believe. I was very proud um, when we were one of the first cities to declare ourselves a sanctuary city um, in the wake of um, some of Trump's moves. And yet here we are. Um, and a really, I think, important statistic about BI Inc.'s um, management or or implementation of this ankle monitoring system is these 100,000 immigrants, n greater than 95% of them would show up to all of the things that supposedly these, this ankle monitoring program is supposed to add assurances to. They would show up just under community programs that have been studied. So whether you shackle these folks, whether you put an ankle monitor on them, or do nothing. They will, they will comply. So they're in compliance regardless. So this is a money-making scheme that is causing these horrors, one of which is a story that I wanna share with you. One of the migrants included in a civil rights case against BI said the ankle tracking device burned her ankle while it was charging, causing her skin to chafe. Another had to go to the hospital after her monitor produced an electric shock when she picked up a metal pan. I asked counsel to involve the community and yourselves in these decisions about this company right here in our city. Thank you. Thank you. So Patrick Murphy is up now and then Gina McAfee. <coughs> My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. The Muni is now going in circles, or should I say a downward spiral. In 2015, the district court said, Boulder, you can't go to condemnation until you go to the PUC and define what will be condemned. Apparently, Boulder forgot, but the district court didn't and in 2019 had to say the same thing again. What are we, forgetful or just thick? The mayor has said to me, we have a plan B, C, and D. No, we don't. Here's a plan B that could not only put us at 100% renewables now, but leave us with about four million to spend out of the carbon taxes we're currently collecting. Boulder's total annual electric usage is about 1.3 billion kilowatt hours. We can subtract the renewables that are credited only to Boulder, not to Excel, and we end up with 892 million kilowatt hours. If we use Excel's Renewables Connect to pay for all of this to be renewables at the rate of four tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour, our annual cost per year would be about $3.6 million to have 100% carbon-free electricity. Who gets renewable credit for Renewables Connect? Boulderwood, not Excel. Based on the fact that we currently collect about $7.8 million in carbon taxes, we would have about $4.2 million left over for additional carbon reduction efforts. That should be a gut punch to the Muni supporters who criticize Excel endlessly but fail to critically review the Muni. We need to think straight, lose the hate, and collaborate, not litigate. Our current actions are insufficient. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Then next, Gina McAfee, and after Gina is Rachel Friend. 
Uh, good evening, I'm Jenna McAfee. Um, I'm one of the organizers of the June 27th protest against BI. We organized that because of stories that we had heard from immigrants in Colorado who had been mistreated by BI employees. Um, I wish to point out that the ankle monitoring that is being implemented by BI was originally developed for the criminal justice system and is still being used by the criminal justice system. Um, the great majority of immigrants that are in the ISAP program that wear these ankle monitors are not criminals. They are just coming to the United States to seek asylum. And we put them in this very onerous, we fir first put them in detention and then we put them in this very onerous ankle monitoring and ISAP program. Um, I also attended an August 8th meeting with BI and a coalition of immigrant immigration advocates. Uh, we brought to their attention the stories that we had heard of abusive and bullying behavior. Um, this has remained unaddressed by them. They did send us a letter um, addressing three of our other issues, but they did not address the primary issue, which is the abusive and bullying behavior that we have documented. They have since called our concerns misdirected attacks and deliberate mischaracterizations, and we take great affront at that. Your original, action, your, your original action in early August to withdraw a contract with BI um, actually helped us in our discussions with BI. It gave us some credibility. We urge you to reconsider policy, policies that give BI credibility. Boulder must do everything it can to clearly state that we do not support profiting off the suffering of immigrants. Thank you, Gina. And then and I will also say I have copies of all the stories that I will give to the city clerk. Rachel Friend, and then after Rachel, Madeline Goldstein. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Friend, Boulder resident. Um, I'm here along with other concerned citizens about the use of contracted police officers by BI. Um, I'm an attorney and I've represented asylum seekers who are detained in Aurora. I've seen up close the horrors and dehuman dehumanizing conditions of the private prison industry. Um, and, and I think that Gina's point can't be overstated. These are people who are not even accused of a crime. Like we're, we're treating people like criminals who are not criminals and the ankle bracelets are part of that. Um, so tonight I wanna read a few words about that. Uh, again, these are by people who can't be here, so we're, we are trying to be their voice. Agents are regularly abusive towards program participants, frequently yelling during appointments and over the phone and refusing to meet with participants' lawyers or allow the lawyers to attend appointments. I can vouch for that. One uh, participating reported that an agent became enraged and started throwing objects when she could not provide a friend's contact information. Another was threatened with deportation because she brought her child to her ISAP check-in. Um, so I would ask that council have public engagement and take all possible steps to not assist the private prison industry, especially as it pertains to immigrants. And I think that a lot of us were very confused um, and felt like there was a lack of transparency when you know we had agreed not to allow Boulder Police to do the private um, contracting and then that felt like it was slid back in without uh, having a, a chance to engage on this. So public engagement and uh, trying very hard not to support the private in private prison industry would be extremely welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Next is Madeline Goldstein, and after Madeline is Katie Farnan. Hi, my name is Madeline Goldstein. I'm a Jewish American mother, and I live in Boulder, here in Boulder in this beautiful city, and it's with great horror that I think that this, as a sanctuary city, would in any way participate with a group like BI. To me, what it feels like and seems like, you know, when they were building the concentration camps and the gas chambers in Nazi Germany, maybe a company like BI isn't gassing the people, but they're providing the, the means by which that can be done. And the horror stories are just too, too awful and we are Americans and what's being done is being done in our name with our tax money. And I think it's really horrific that this is happening. 
and I'm going to read the testimony of somebody who's been in the ISAP program and has been mistreated. And this has to do with the whole immigrant crisis that's happening in this country everywhere. This lovely lady said, I've had this on for about 10 months, and my ISAP office has never even mentioned the ankle monitor. They never ask if it hurts me or if it's still working. I know people who have had theirs taken off after eight days or three months, but mine is still on. And we, I asked the council to explore all options at your disposal to fully address the lack of oversight and accountability of both BI and GO. These are money-making institutions that are making money off the suffering and terror of not only adults, but children. And for any of us that are parents, we have to know what it's like to not know if your child is safe, if they're being raped, if they're being tortured, if they have any food. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Katie Farnan is next, followed by Beth Hondorf. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Katie Farnan. I live in Gun Barrel. Um, I read the Daily Camera's recent editorial on BI Inc., and I agree that the city needs to take a stand now on this company, which operates at a national level and is based right here in Boulder. Regardless of the decision whether or not to contract uh, off-duty police officers with BI, the larger question I have is whether City of Boulder is going to stand by its earlier words of affirmation about standing in solidarity with immigrants in this community. We are talking about inhumane treatment of our residents and neighbors in a community based in our city, in Gun Barrel. I ask that the city investigate to the fullest extent what it can do to ensure that reported abuse that you've heard tonight, that we have shared, reported abuse by BI case managers be stopped. That BI answer the community in terms of what it plans to do to improve its practices and stop harming people. There is, as you may know, a coalition of community residents, I'm one of them, uh, and immigrant rights advocates who are currently working with BI executives to get answers to the very specific areas of concern over conditions and treatment, and those are the ones highlighted in the stories that we've shared. That coalition needs support. Uh, they need support in their effort to get answers that will improve lives for Boulder residents. So I want to read a brief quote from an immigrant who is under the care of BI, our Boulder-based <laughs> company. My ISAP officer treats me like I am a criminal. He yells at me. I feel constantly afraid that I may be doing something wrong. The ankle monitor wakes me up at night and I cannot keep it from beeping. So I ask council to explore all options at your disposal to stick to the values that you set forth as a council, and what are we prepared to do? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Beth Hondorf, and followed by Chris Alred. Good evening. Beth Hondorf, 2710 Fourth Street. Used to be on Boza for five years. Um, I've been in Alpine Balsam area since 1976, and I'm here to talk about the traffic plan, which I've talked to people about before. I think staff has been, um, it's just not complete. There's five other projects online, um, and we were given some type of presentation about Iris and Broadway uh, and the traffic, how that might uh, affect us, but the estimates were between two to 500 units. So. How can you make a decision about 311 when the traffic plan has just got huge holes in it? The other study from, from um, not 311, I'm sorry, Alpine Balsam is uh, incomplete. It was done when no one, when low time of year and at a time of day when the traffic was not high, there's supposed to be two hour traffic counts during rush hour, that wasn't done. Um, Plus Long's Garden, that's up in the air. There's more traffic there. How can you make a decision? We also, I went to planning board and they said no CIP was planned for the area. We need one. Um, <clears throat> I've been in this neighborhood since 76. Um, you need to also make a decision now about the development plan or the area plan for the, I don't agree with shelving it because I think it's gonna, a carrot and stick routine. It's gonna come back and kick us in the butt and we're gonna get it anyway. I don't accept it, you know, it's a ploy. Um, why am I so upset about traffic? 
because they don't do the, their job. I had a family member who was very seriously injured on the roundabouts 12 years ago. And just now, in the last month, I hear that uh, traffic has finally decided that they are at the full width around the roundabouts. This should have been done 15 years ago. And um, this, this makes me really insecure about what's going on in my neighborhood. Also, I have pictures I'm gonna send you. I live right on the construction for 311. Um, and I have huge holes in my street on Alpine and in front of my house. I've asked the city Thank about you, holes in my, my alley. They told me to fix it myself. I fixed it and I got it. Thank warning. you, Beth. Thank you. Um, Chris and then Lynn, Lynn Siegel. Good evening, Council. Chris Allred commenting for Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. I'm here to share an update from an independent scientist hired by Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center to study the contamination out at Rocky Flats. Uh, this study is by Michael Ketterer, PhD, Professor Emeritus, Chemistry and Biochemistry at Northern Arizona University. It has been known for decades that soils near Rocky Flats are contaminated with elevated levels of plutonium from routine emissions, negligent waste disposal, and fires. So it is important to recognize that plutonium originating from Rocky Flats can be found in two distinct forms. A, plutonium that is dispersed relatively uniformly throughout all the soil particles, and B, hot particles of essentially pure plutonium dioxide. To date, studies conducted by the federal government have focused on the former uniformly dispersed form rather while largely ignoring the latter. This study performed a series of experiments specifically designed to detect small di plutonium dioxide particles. The study reveals the presence of six plutonium dioxide particles ranging from 0.8 to 2.6 microns in diameter. So these are particles smaller than the diameter of a human hair. They are referred to as respirable. They can be lodged in the lung tissue on a long-term basis. Plutonium dioxide particles contained within the lungs will release their alpha decay energy. A plutonium dioxide particle of 2.6 microns will generate tens of thousands of radioactive decay events per day. So this, the potential health effects and risk of inhaling plutonium dioxide particles must be immediately assessed. And this is relevant to the Rocky Mountain Greenway. I ask that the council halt plans for construction of the Rocky Mountain Greenway and take more time to assess these risks. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Lynn, and then Elizabeth Black. Yeah, um, I remember when Michael uh, Kettering. Lynn, can you introduce yourself? Lynn Siegel, um, Mountain Heights. Michael Kettering explained to me what a hot particle was. And then I found out this week from my brother that we actually moved to Denver in 1957, the year of the fire, and my mom died in 1969 of leukemia in Seattle. So my guess is she got it there. Um, okay, I want to talk to you tonight about alpine balsam. Um, the area plan should not be deferred. You know, when people want to keep their incumbent seats on council, they need to, to do the people's work while they're on the council, up until the minute they're gone, not defer it to the next. And um, this is gonna come back. And we should have had not only an area plan, but a major area plan, like all the area plans, when this hospital was first decided to be used for something else and moved to a different place. That's when the area plan should have been in effect, and it should be now, and it should never be tossed out um, for political reasons. Um, also, I wanna say, you need to stop the, uh, there needs to be a stay of demolition on the hospital, at the Boulder Community Hospital, not Boulder Community Health, and on the interior of the medical pavilion, which is a high-end medical office. You can move in there yourselves, or you can rent it out, you know, tear down a wall and put in the thing for the Planning and Development Services Center for a counter space, you know, re redo that space. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is Ponderosa. 
Again, stop kicking the can down to the next council. Um, the non-conforming use is basically gonna take mobile homes out of existence and put in instead duplexes, triplexes, and ironically, the people that are arguing for mobile homes are the same ones that are arguing for single family houses still. Um, so that's my beat. That's it. Thank you. I have a whole lot to tell you, but there's never, you can't even begin to touch it in two minutes. Yeah. And after Elizabeth, we have Alexis. Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. I'm back with As the Headgate Turns and the Pretend Jones, Young, and Weaver Ditches. Mm -hmm. All three pretend farmers can run water from April to July and each irrigates 600 acres. Because farm labor is so scarce, Jones, Young, and Weaver grow commodity crops and employ just two other workers each. And because their water season is short, they plant water thrifty, low profit millet, barley, and wheat on most of their land. They use free water, water others aren't using in the spring to start their grains in March. They save their ditch water for 200 acres of corn or sugar beets. Then they buy a little CBT water to finish off their high value crops in August. But as CBT water, prices skyrocket, they're each rethinking things. Jones watches the county's lentil test plots and wants to try a dryland nitrogen fixing crop. But uncertain markets and expensive harvesting equipment scare her off. Young is stuck because she joined the sugar co-op and contracted to deliver 5,000 tons of sugar beets a year or pay a $20,000 annual fine. Water prices eat up her beet profits. She's thinking of turning her water and land into thousands of homes. Weaver is shooting for the moon and planting hemp. <laughs> Despite what the internet says, hemp needs water. So Weaver doubled his last bid and got 200 CBT acre feet for $50,000 for just one season of water. Now he's waking up nights in a cold sweat, ever since he saw the most recent CBT price hike. That's, that plus his debt for this year's water gnaws at him. Next year, uh, next time I'll tell you about the Yates, Brockett, and Nagel ditches in our next exciting installment of As the Headgate Turns. Thank you. All right. Can't wait. <laughs> it's just like you, Sam. Um, Alexis. Hi, Alexia Parks, uh, 973 Fifth Street, Boulder. Um, I want to talk to you tonight briefly about, in two minutes, about an energy futures toolkit uh, because I'd like to have you use me as a resource. I've been a resource for um, the community ever since I moved here in the 1960s, so it's about 60 years. Um, in with the thoughts about Rocky Flats, uh, I was uh, funded by the Rand Corporation to represent public opinion uh, at the end of the 70s. Um, uh, on nuclear waste and nuclear issues in Washington, D.C., and I made a lot of waves there because at the same time I was also uh, r uh, a correspondent for the National Desk of the Washington Post writing on energy issues. But that's my background. In 1980, uh, the city of Boulder paid me $10,000 to develop a program called the Energy Futures Conference. Out of that, uh, we acted as if we had only one year to make a rapid transition to a uh, world without oil, basically focused on renewable energy and energy alternatives. Out of that came the first green building ordin ordinance in the entire country, so to your great credit. Um, I uh, took that also and I took it, it, we basically looked at all 10 energy, 10 energy use sectors. I took that to the U.S. mayors. I also took it uh, for the next 20 years. Our last uh, programs I ran actively, um, both in person and online, were in 2008 with the city of Netherlands and also Des Moines. We have the, we now are taking that online and we're training energy facilitators uh, throughout the country, but we'd like to start with inviting Boulder and I have some information I can send you by email. We also have the Sustainability 2020, which is a fifth and sixth grade home energy uh, uh, challenge 
so they can be doing in uh, at their own homes and the data goes online for use by the cities, again, throughout the county and beyond. Uh, we have 23 Ingredients, it's a new uh, food security uh, book, and that's for immigrants uh, improving health through um, nutrition and improving mental health through locally sourced nutrient-dense foods. Uh, I did send something and she can perhaps distribute it to you all. There's four in that toolkit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, why don't you just email us some of this. All right, we'll do that. That'd be great. Okay, I think we have some special younger guests that were here to talk to us about transportation. They did. They already yeah, left. They left. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to close um, public comment then. Open comment. And let me turn to you, staff. So two items, um, a gentleman was here talking about E. coli in Boulder Creek. We do have a report on that and we'll make sure that our water utilities division gets that information to city council. And then the second item was many comments with regard to BI and CAC scheduled this under matters from the city manager on October 1st, of city attorney, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, colleagues? Comment? Um, I had one follow up with um, <clears throat> the woman whose parking was blocked by the construction, Jane. What are the rules about that when, when you're occupying a, a parking spot? I'm sure we have parking regulations that govern that. Yeah, we do. I, I, I'm not sure if they apply that on private property. So that is maybe the issue. So, it's so that's a handicap spot, right, it's a, 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 for people with disabilities, so I thought we had some enforcement that went on to private. We do do some enforcement of that. Um, it depends on the, um, whether it's, it is a public area or not, or private, um, but yes, so um, that's potentially. Right, and we can follow up with Boulder Housing Partners, because I believe she's a resident of a BHP facility, so we'll have um, our human services, housing and human services follow up. Very good, thank you. Sure. Cindy? I was gonna ask that, that I know I live in the neighborhood, I live a half a block away, and um, got an, a postcard from the project manager, so I would think that the people who live there would have the same rights as people who live in the neighborhood in terms of what's going on in their locale. Where yeah, absolutely. So if you got that mailing, I, I think it is likely that most of the people in that facility did, but we can follow up again with BHP to make that'd sure. Be, that'd be great. I think of them as being semi-public mm. because of the way the city collaborates with them in building housing. So I, I have one more short thing, and that's just um, to remind the public in case it didn't, the message didn't get across that the large homes, large lots um, project got rescheduled at the study session. We basically took a straw poll of council and so we received a whole bunch of notes on that and I just wanna make sure that people are aware that that project is not moving forward in this council. And I just wanted to repeat, if I heard correctly, um, Suzanne, you said, so I heard someone in the audience asking about the BI will have a um, discussion mm -hmm. that it will be under the uh, matters from the city attorney on August 1st, correct? October, October 1st. For October 1st. Um, yeah, because uh, Councilwoman Morzell requested that and she's gonna be gone the next two meetings. So we were trying to find a time when she was gonna be here. Um, so just, we'll, just talk, clear. we'll talk both substance and process. And, and I think it's worth noting that my understanding to date is this has been staff decisions, both the decision to, to decide to, um, I mean, we've more or less stated we don't have any contracts with them, and then it became clear that there was this other direction where we have off-duty police that provide security and then it was reversed and internally there were staff objections to that. So at any rate, we'll hear all of this, I assume, right, that's the October right. 1st. That's right. Oh, and I should note also that city attorney is also out of town right now. Yeah. That's also why we scheduled it for not immediately. So thank you all for coming to talk to us about that. Any other comments from colleagues, council members? Okay, we are gonna keep moving forward. Your consent agenda tonight is items A through L. 
So I'll just note, we have three matters on here that we thought were worth pausing to speak at least briefly about. So um, I'm gonna turn to Sam to talk about <laughs> item G. Okay, so there's two things about item G. First, I wanted to check in with um, Council Member Carlisle. You had sent a hotline that specifically flagged this. Was there anything that you wanted to bring up around this? Well, yes, I, I was curious about what our, there is, it says, this is on page 48 of 836. Can I just clarify, this is the 30th and Pearl yeah. item that we're talking yes. about here for the yep. public. The, I can't remember the name of it. it started it's before. 30 Pearl, 30 and Pearl. it's the, known as the old Pollard site. So it says that um, in terms of rents, this is the below um, market commercial space, and that there is a pilot project to be administered by Community Vitality and restricts commercial rents to 75% of the prevailing rents. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how that was gonna be measured because obviously in areas like East Arapahoe, it's much lower than it is on Pearl Street. So I'd like some clarification with um, those kinds of numbers. Okay, is there another one? There is another one. Okay. The other thing was the, um, I think the same thing in terms of the prices for the the rent, the affordable, permanently affordable housing, it would be X amount of the area median income. And I'm wondering, again, as we know, our median area median income is rising as more jobs come in to the community that command higher wages. And so are we really going to be able to address the people who we hope to be able to address with this as we have escalating costs within the community? I'd just like to see some analysis on this going forward so that it's not something that we as a community are putting our tax dollars and land ban banked um, land into for housing and find that it's not really within reach. Of those so, so we have Kurt answer those questions? If he is here, that'd be wonderful. Excellent. Um, Kurt Fernhauer, Director of Housing and Human Services. So um, let me first address the, um, uh, the affordable commercial. So again, this is, a, this is a pilot. So we'll probably be learning things through those pilots as well. So there's a, um, there's a process that's similar to if you get your, your home appraised, you hire an appraiser, the appraiser is gonna look at the condition of the home, they're gonna look at where it's located. Um, they're gonna look at the size, that sort of thing. There's a similar um, uh, service for um, uh, valuing rental spaces as well. So it wouldn't be compared to um, something on Pearl Street, it wouldn't be compared to something in South Boulder. It would be specific to that site location. So that will be done every five years um, to ensure that it stays sort of in that, um, um, that right range um, of affordable rents. So that's, that's, an, that's an outside service that's, that's done in the, in the community that we'll be using. And does that come back to the council for review at some point to address the second concern that I, I used? I found my other notes here buried in the book um, about it staying within an affordable range. I mean, it may be variable in terms of evaluations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be affordable. So you're, now you're talking about the affordable rents of the apartments? No, I was actually still, t well, I'm talking about both, but also the commercial. Okay, so the commercial is not related to the uh, the AMIs, which I think you were. Um, I did say right. That was the second part, but the commercials being. Yeah, but every five years when that's adjusted, uh, that won't come back to city council. Just as an information item to the public, to the council, I think it would be sure, interesting. Absolutely, since this is such a huge investment and it's such a huge area. Yeah, so that's correct. It wouldn't come back to city council for a decision, but an IP would be. Um, a great way to communicate that, Spec you know, um, as it's a pilot, that would that would be how we would want to communicate that. Yep. Right. Is it working? Yep. So the other was, um, for example, you say in these two quadrants where there will be um, affordable, permanently affordable. How much money is 
30 to 60% of the AMI, like right now. And then given these escalating wages in the city of Boulder, has there been any assessment made of what they may be when this is actually built out? Um, so it, it's, it's, um, I'm not gonna, ha I don't have all the, all that data in my head right now. Um, the AMI depends on the, on the family size. Mm -hmm. Um, and the AMI for a, a household of one is different for three and four and that sort of thing. Um, what I can say, um, is that, um, thir 30 of the unit, the affordable units, um, will be affordable to 30% of the AMI. And so uh, um, the, the main strategy for getting to the concerns that you have um, is for us to have a range of, of AMIs that it's affordable to. Um, according to our IH policy, 60% is what we target as affordable rental. But on this property and others that we do, we'll be looking for a range of AMIs. So there'll also be um, eight units at 40%, 27 at 50%, and 55 at 60% um, of AMI. And then there'll, there'll also be units for permanent supportive housing as well. Um, so it's really a, a, a broad range of affordability. Right, and I noted that there are, well, there are 287 units altogether, right? Uh, I think that's about the correct, whole yes. piece, mm -hmm. and of those, how many of those are permanently affordable? So at this time, 120 of them will be rental um, affordable, and then um, Quadrant 4 North, um, I don't know if I can explain that further. Um, I, I did make a, a short presentation, if you want me to show that, otherwise I can answer the questions. Um, but we're anticipating some home ownership affordable units there as well. So it, th those numbers don't capture that at this point. So I actually think, given the importance of this project, maybe we should have Kurt show us a few slides. That'd be great. Why don't you go ahead great. and do that? That'd be, that'd be great. And, and also I'm curious about the 10 um, permanent supportive housing and how you arrived at that number, given the, if there are 287 units here. Okay. Oh, you've got the slides. Yep. This is prepared. Well, great. Uh, these, great. this is an important project, yep. and it's actually um, pretty memorable, <coughs> and so we thought it was worth it. Yeah, I can go on to the next one, yep. So I'm just gonna take it, um, I've just got four very short slides. Um, I, wa I wanna go through what's happening in each one of the quadrants. So um, the first quadrant, um, which is at 30th and Pearl, um, 30th is on your, your left side running up and down and, and Pearl is at the bottom. Um, that's um, uh, um, an area, actually I should, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So um, before I start, this is a partnership between the city and Boulder Housing Partners. We're acting as co-developers um, on this property and bringing it through the entitlement process um, with construction anticipated um, later this fall. Um, if you could go on to the next one. So quadrant one, um, we have a, um, um, a sales agreement um, that's in, in front of you tonight. Um, to sell it to Morgan Creek Ventures, um, quadrant one. This is where the, the affordable commercial will be on this quadrant that we just spoke about. It's about 19,000 square feet. Half of it will be um, affordable. Um, and then 70, 76 um, market units. So quadrant two is a property that will be developed um, entirely by BHP. Um, with 80 affordable units, and you'll see this is where you'll have the range of 30 to 60 percent of AMI, um, as well as the 10 uh, permanent supportive housing um, units there. So the um, the number 10 um, isn't necessarily a magic number, but we've started doing this throughout our developments within the city. Um, and 10, 10 to 12 units seems, with our experience that we've had over the last year and a half, um, seems to be a good number. Um, it, it, it gives a critical mass of supportive services. So services can, can go out and provide services to 10, you know, residents. Um, and, you know, spreading this throughout different affordable housing um, developments, um, you know, doesn't have other impacts um, as well. So in our experience, our short experience over the last year and a half, 10 to 12 seems to be um, something that works well. 
Could I stop you right there yep. and ask if, if a place like Glen Willow, which is being re, re, refitted now, it's being refurbished and completely, is there any sort of retrospective view at something like that and putting in permanently a supportive housing there? Um, I would have to reply to you in hotline. On that would be great. It's yep. just a, an aside while we're talking yep. about it. Hey, and just as you go through and explain these quadrants, yep. in terms of the timing, we're selling quadrant one, I believe, to help pay for quadrant two. That's that correct. So that sale will um, happen um, the first week in November. Um, at the same time, those funds will be um, used to help fund the, the tax credit financing um, for quadrants two and four south. Um, so the, um, if you could go on to the next um, slide. So quadrant three, um, that, will, um, uh, that will eventually be uh, market condominiums um, of 62. Um, however, quadrants two and three are gonna be developed um, together for the next year. There's a parking garage that goes under two and three. Um, and so we can't actually break it up into separate properties until that parking garage is completed. So once the parking garage is completed, quadrant three will be created as a, a condominium, which will enable us to, to sell that um, um, for those market units. And again, those funds will, will go into the um, development of the affordable units on the site. Kurt, can I interrupt you with the question? Yep. <clears throat> um, when the... Uh, company develops the 62 market condominiums, do they have to pay into the um, inclusionary housing fee? Um, no, but we're taking that into consideration. It's actually one site. Um, it's not four different sites. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we'll be taking the, the revenues from that sale and putting it directly in. So the, the, the value of the property is actually, um, is a higher value as a result of that. I see. Okay. Yep. I have another question regarding Quadrant 3, um, and that has to do with um, the agreement to construct and maintain um, the park. And um, yesterday morning at CAC, I asked um, what's in place to make sure that that um, agreement happens, and um, Sam mentioned, <coughs> well, that's probably a, a condition of approval. But my question is not about that future agreement, it's about what's in place right now to remind us that that's gonna happen because people leave, personnel changes, and you just never know what could happen. Just to ensure that that is not forgotten. <laughs> so we actually have an, um, 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 an interdepartmental agreement between um, a parks, parks and Rec and Housing and Human Services that defines that process. Okay. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, quadrants, um, quadrant four south, that's also going to have um, affordable commercial space, but it's not falling under the, this pilot program. Four south will be owned by Boulder Housing Partners, um, and they will have um, affordable commercial space for the um, residents that, that live there um, who have developmental um, disabilities. And so Four South is really focused on that, um, on that population as well. Um, f Quadrant Four North um, will be used um, initially as collateral um, for the development of the, of the project. And then next year that will be sold um, as um, for, uh, for sale housing. And we're really focusing on, on trying to have e some sort of cooperative type um, development there, either co-housing um, or co-op development. And um, that is, um, uh, we don't have the number of units on there, but I think it's about 28 units that would so be on. 29 in the minimum. 29. So I have a question for you about that. <clears throat> yep. It says this quadrant is expected to provide affordable ownership units with a preference for co-housing or co-op. Will all of those 29 be affordable? Probably about half. Half, okay, yep. thank you. Is that? Um, and that's it. <clears throat> well, great. Um, do people have any more questions? I just wanna gush when the time comes. Yeah, but why don't we gush now? Okay. Um, 
So Kurt, I'm really impressed with this project. I mean, we get to over 50% affordable units or right near 50% mm -hmm. affordable units, which is fantastic. I also just wanna remind everybody that Boulder Housing Partners was not the original developer for this. And so when we switched mm -hmm. um, from the original one to Boulder Housing Partners, there's a lot of work that had to be done. And this project incorporates so many excellent elements. I mean, it's got the developmental disability um, component to it. It's got a co-housing and co-op component to it. It's got permanently affordable commercial space, which is something we're trying to learn our way around. And so this will be a place we can learn. And we use, to the, to the extent that market rate development happens here, we're using it to promote affordable housing and it's doing the, the economic um, <clears throat> diversity mm -hmm. in one location, which is something that we have tried and tried to do as much as we can, but we often struggle with that when it's strictly private. So I think this is a fantastic project. Thank you. And it's developing the park that's been in the plan for forever. So um, yeah, I want to thank you and your staff for putting together this plan that is, um, it's jumping up and down and doing flips and contortions, but it <laughs> seems to be working out something. It's going to meet the deadline. Bob. A um, couple of facts and then I'll gush too. First of all, Cindy asked a couple of questions which I happen to know the answer to, so I'll help you out, Kurt. 30% of, uh, of AMI for a family of four is $34,000 and 60% of um, AMI for a family of four is double that, 68,000. I think you observed to uh, us when we were looking at the Middle Income Down Payment Assistance Program a few weeks ago, that over a lengthy period of time, I think it was about 15 or 20 year measuring period, the AMI had actually gone up at about an annualized rate of about 2.3, 2.4%. That's correct. Th that's obviously lumpy. Some years yeah. it goes up higher, some years it's flat. <clears throat> um, but over a long period of time, it's averaged a little bit less than 3%. One other thing I'll say about um, jumps in AMI, which do occasionally happen, um, I happen to be the council's liaison to Boulder Housing Partners, and in years where the AMI does increase significantly, um, Boulder Housing Partners, at least I can't speak for other um, affordable housing providers, does not, typically does not raise um, rents to the fullest extent they can, even if AMI goes up. Um, they tend to hold those rent increases to in the zip code of two to 3%, even if AMI went up 5% in a given year. So I think there is some protection there, at least uh, from Boulder Housing Partners, which is obviously gonna run this facility. I'll move on to gushing. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, one thing I'm, uh, two things I'm really happy about this project, the permit support of housing in quadrant two, the 10 units, you know, you, you set forth for us, Kurt, about a year and a half ago, a year ago, a goal of creating 100 permanently supportive housing units to house formerly homeless people in our community, and this gets us 10% of the way just with one project, so thank you for that. And with respect to the um, 20 units of housing, in quadrant uh, four south uh, for developmentally disabled adults. I, I'm particularly happy that there's a, there was a three-way partnership here between our, our uh, housing uh, services and Boulder Housing Partners in Ramble on Pearl. We, um, Ramble on Pearl mm -hmm. provides a great service for job training for developmentally disabled adults, and they wanted to move into a situation where they can start housing those adults in a, um, in a supervised and supportive environment. This is their first venture in that, and the fact that they're gonna have an enterprise right downstairs where those individuals can work. I think it's just a, a fabulous partnership, so thanks for bringing that together. And they get to stay on Pearl. Yeah, <laughs> they get to stay on Pearl, oh, just a little farther east. Oh. Ramble on Pearl. Excellent, um, go ahead. So, so, Kurt, thank you for answering the questions. I'm still concerned about affordability in the community, um, particularly with these HOA fees that came up sometime earlier in the year. So, but, it is, it's a great project, and I know it's taken a lot of work on a fairly short schedule to put it together. So thank you for the explanation. Excellent, um, and yes, thank you, and, and thank you to BHP for stepping up and doing such a great job. We're, there you are, thank you. Perfect. All right, um, with that, there's a couple other issues we wanted to highlight. Another one of them is L. Um, um, which has to do with solar on top of city parking garages. Does somebody want to step up to the plate on that? Yeah. Okay. Oh. There we go. And I, yeah, and I had, um, I guess I had a question, or I'll frame it as a question. Um, the this issue came up during the 
as we were moving forward and obtaining permits for the actual construction, is that correct? Correct. That, that the, the height wasn't being measured, as the assumption of where the height was wasn't being measured correctly. So we're amending that ordinance to, um, to correct that oversight. And, um, and this is um, a city project, it's on a city parking garage. And um, my question, I guess, is um, given that this is happening on an emergency basis, what, um, if this were not the city mm -hmm. and it were a private garage and a private developer doing a similar project, would we um, still be amending the ordinance? Um, hi, I'm Yael Gishan with Climate Initiatives, and um, it's a great question. Um, so what, just to back up one step, the, um, what the code change is doing is it's providing a clarification. So when this code um, was written, it talks about flat roofs and pitched roofs. It doesn't <coughs> have language in there that specifies the sloped roof or the ramp. And so that clarification is, is what we're up against here with the, the height measurement. So it provides that clarification. And um, going forward, that clarification will be there for any other parking garage that wishes to put solar on it, there are some privately owned garages in the city that are at the height limit as well, so it will be a useful code consideration should that come up in the future. Um, we are up against a tax credit deadline here, and so that's the emergency nature of this, that this is part of a portfolio of um, 14 different projects that are traveling together and have to travel together to be completed for this tax credit deadline. Um, they're the emergency, so that's the emergency nature of this, and I think that what we're um, considering here is something that would be useful for other garages in the future. And there are instances where for private sector customers where we've um, done things in this manner, variances, there's the case of the Avalon Ballroom where it didn't come to the council level, but it certainly came to our city attorney level where there was um, things that were moved forward to make that project happen um, that were outside of maybe what you would call our normal code process. And I can also, um, Call in, Chris, if there's anything else you want to speak to on that. Oh, okay. And um, so just a thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. And um, as an additional question, or yeah, question, this, um, these solar panels will be considered a pertinence? Correct. Is that correct? And um, in the charter, the charter um, does allow for a pertinences to go over 50, the 55 foot charter limit. Is that correct? Correct, by 10 feet. And w will this be going up above the 55 foot height limit? It will go the 10 feet, it will take up the 10 foot appurtenance. So the top of the garage was measured from the roof deck and the when it was designed, and so the design is 10 feet above that. So from the ground level to the top of the solar is 65 feet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cindy. So I would just like to comment that I think bringing something like this at the last minute, I recognize that it has to be done mm -hmm. by, like right now, right. but it's a large enough piece in terms of the height limit, and this is mm -hmm. a different kind of appurtenance. I realize it's a desirable one, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, because it's of where it is on Pearl Street Correct. and how high it will be, yep. to have this kind of thing come to us and have to act on it at the last minute without any public weighing in, mm -hmm. I think is a little difficult for me at any rate. So that's just a comment. Um, 65 feet, was it? Well, I think you just said it, but yeah. this was passed by voters, right? The appurtenance. Right. Um, it, can you s say that again, the details so the, of that? The, the, the appurtenance was in the charter, I believe, and this code was written to address that, to more specifically address that, and when the code was written, it spoke to pitched roofs and flat roofs in relation to the appurtenance. This roof has a ramp that slopes up it, so there was just a lack of clarity around where to measure that roof height from. So we, when the, when the system was designed, they took the roof deck and just drew like a straight line across the air as the height of the building, whereas one could read the code today and consider the ramp that slopes down as the height of the building, so it would go like that, right? right? And I could show you a picture if that's more helpful. So it's a clarification of the code. It's to address this specific roof type of a building that wasn't addressed as the code was written today. Right. So yeah, is, um, if, if, um, if measured the way that um, buildings are 
typically measured in, in terms of um, the lowest point from the bottom mm -hmm. of the building, you know, from the street level. Um, if you measured it that way, what would the height be? So it might be helpful to pull up that slide. Um, it's still at the same height, but if you measure it from the ramp, the ramp is lower than 55 feet, but I believe the code allows you to go 10 feet above that. So you would only be allowed to go to say it was at 48 feet feet, you'd only be allowed to go to 58 feet from that ramp. So the ramp you see that goes down there, that biggest wedge portion of the ramp is greater than 10 feet if you're measuring the roof deck um, from the ramp. And if you hit an arrow on the slide, what, what the design did was it measured the height going across there all mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. from the highest point of the deck to the highest point of the deck, not including the ramp. So that's what this code does is allows for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, oh, go ahead, Aaron. Right, and this is part of the, the package is what, two and a half megawatts of installed solar on exactly. different city buildings, right? Yes. Okay, well, I appreciate you bringing this to us so we can get it yeah. done and get Thank all that you. great solar. Thank you, and I apologize for the last minute nature of it. Yeah. Better, well, better now than, than never. I was gonna say, that's a good reason though, to have an emergency if, if it's, I know we, we're trying to get the tax credits. Um, okay, well, given that the voters uh, agree to both this and the pursuit of solar, I think um, it makes a lot of sense. Does anybody else have questions or gushing? I, I have a comment I wanna make. <clears throat> I mean, it's pretty clear to me that the intent of our height limit being 55 feet w would not really include this ramp type. I mean, because the corner, the other corner at the top is at 55 feet and appurtenances, a word I have trouble with, um, are definitely approved in the charter. So I think this is exactly what you wanna do. Solar on parking structures has two effects. It reduces the amount of heating and cooling you have to do when a person gets in the car because they've shaded the car and it produces power while it's doing that. So I think this is a really good project, thank well, you. Well, and I think in this case, it also um, creates an additional um, amount of parking um, by way of the full top floor getting used because that top floor is usually empty. Mm -hmm. yep. Great, and it creates a rule that works for both public and private sector. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there was one other issue that leads us into one of our call-ups as well, and that's Ponderosa. So, were you gonna present a little bit? Okay, and, that, and this is item K. And maybe you can explain the call-up the relationship between the consent and call-up as well. So I'm gonna address a handful of uh, questions that I heard from uh, council um, over the last couple of weeks around this. Um, so if you could go to the next next slide. So there's, there's uh, I think, three things I wanna talk about. One was the, the community engagement. Um, one is the, um, uh, the variety of, um, designs and, and the, um, and the other is the uh, affordability. So um, I've just got a summary of some of the community engagement. Um, there's been a, a huge amount of community engagement. We started though at the beginning, um, the, the community actually elected seven leaders um, called the Resident Leadership Committee um, to represent the community um, in a lot of the um, the work that was done. Um, and there's been four habitat tours of habitat homes in, in the city of Boulder. We have a resident guide that's been updated five times, so every question that we get in any meeting or email or anything, we put in the resident guide with, with the um, answers to that, both in um, English and Spanish. And um, I actually failed at the very beginning to ask if there, we have a translator here tonight. Um, if there's any translation that anyone would require. Para esta parte de la presentación, si alguien necesita interpretación al español, puede buscarme. Okay, thank you. So, um, the, Marina has been our, our translator throughout this, this project as well. Um, we've also had newsletters, um, and um, um, we have a bulletin board out there. A, a lot of residents um, are communicated through text as well. Um, 
We've had 10 community workshops. Some of that was around, um, or a lot of it was around design. Um, and we've had two block parties over the last couple of years, 22 RLC meetings, which are monthly meetings. Um, we've had um, office time um, out at the site where staff go, goes out there and um, makes themselves available um, in the afternoons. And um, over the last three weeks, we've had 20 one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with, with residents in their homes. And we also had a good neighbor meeting with sort of the residents outside and surrounding um, Ponderosa and Rosewood. So the, um, one of the nice things about an annexa annexation agreement is it's, a, it's an agreement that, that um, defines how things are gonna move forward and it creates an agreement. So a couple of the aspects of that agreement, one is that 100% of the homes um, ever built at Ponderosa will be permanently affordable. And they're meeting a range, which we haven't seen anywhere else, um, of 20 to 100, 150% of the AMI. We actually have a, a variety of AMI, uh, AMIs at Ponderosa, um, but we also have um, a large percentage of residents that are in the lower end of that. So we really had to come up with an approach that met their needs. Um, through the annexation agreement, it also says that we allow um, residents in mobile homes to age in place and stay in their mobile homes. So the, the program for affordability um, has a lot of aspects to it. Through Habitat, there's the sweat equity, the volunteer labor, and um, donated materials, many of them through national partnerships. Um, but energy um, efficient design was a real important aspect as well. So these will be near net zero homes. And we were already, the, your, actually your previous item, one of the, the, the solar gardens on that is go, going to be supporting Ponderosa. So that will be put into place soon. And residents can benefit from that whether they're in a, a habitat home or whether they stay in their, in their manufactured home. Um, ongoing land uh, maintenance, um, so there's a couple aspects to that. So while the streets meet um, the majority of the um, requirements for public streets, they will be private streets um, maintained um, through um, as public infrastructure as well as the, uh, the, the sewer and water. Um, there will also be a... Can I interrupt briefly? Yep. Is that street arrangement the same one that we have at Mapleton Mobile Home Park right now? W can you be more specific? Well, I'm not sure who maintains the streets at Mapleton. Thistle administers it, correct? Um, I don't know if um, Crystal... Crystal, can you answer that? Yeah. Okay. So Crystal Launder will come up to answer okay, that. Okay, great. Um, so it's privately maintained. Can you, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, I'm Crystal Launder, housing planner. Thank you. Yes. It being Mapleton Mobile Home Park. Mm -hmm. So this will be a new arrangement for us. That's correct. Um, so the, 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 um, the last slide I have on this is the, the variety of design options. So there's 14 um, what we'll call single family homes, um, which are not attached to other homes um, throughout the community. Um, however, there's all the, all the buildings in orange, we can have a variety of housing types there. They can be single story, two story, um, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. So within that same footprint, there's different designs that we can put together. Um, one of the challenges, and I'll just be very brief on this, that we had with the, the, the Ponderosa community from a design standpoint, is that currently it meets none of the regulatory require requirements um, on setbacks. Um, many of the mobile homes are 20 inches or less um, separated. They don't meet you know, fire separation. And the homes were brought there at a time when they were smaller. Um, mobile homes or manufactured homes are larger in footprint now. So if we replace them, we would have to make them smaller than they are now. Um, and they're already smaller than, than um, many of the, the homes in other parks. So they would have to be custom made um, manufactured homes. And we'd probably have to eliminate a number of them just to get the fire separations. So when we started this project, we talked about a one for one um, replacement. We did look at doing, 
creating the whole neighborhood as single family. Um, we haven't done that as an affordable housing project um, in many years um, from a land value standpoint. Um, but we would have had to reduce um, the number of total housing units um, by, I think it's 30%. Um, so we looked at where we could, creating more single family homes, um, a variety of duplexes, um, triplexes, and there's a couple fourplexes. So really creating a variety of housing types um, um, throughout this process. So, or just ask a question, just in terms of the setback. So what you're saying is that like the current arrangement doesn't meet fire separation requirements, meaning that there's a danger to residents from a fire perspective. <coughs> That's right? correct. So that fires could spread from one home to another. That's correct. Okay, yep. So yeah. consequently, you have duplexes as options to address that. That's correct. Okay. And that also works from an infrastructure standpoint because we want to run infrastructure to the current um, residents. And so when we replace them, we don't want to be pulling and adding um, taps and that sort of thing. So this sort of um, aligns with the, the housing layout that exists there currently. Okay. Oh, sorry, Mary. Thanks for that, Kurt. I have um, questions regarding some of the concerns um, from um, some of the folks that um, currently live there. And one of the concerns um, in an email that we received today was that originally, and there was a, a document that was attached, it was probably one of the initial um, mm -hmm. documents that you said has been revised several times, um, that said that it was going to be 68 homes. And um, I believe now it's, it's going to be 73. Right. So could you talk a little bit about um, how, you know, what drove that to go from 68 to 73 and why? Sure. So I think the document that you're referring to says approximately 68. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's really about, um, so um, one, one of the things we talk about in our department is we wake up every morning to create affordable housing in our community. Um, and this, this project is trying to create a balance of designing for the needs of the current community while also designing for the needs of the future community as well as the goals of the city overall. And so it was really, um, as, we, as we did the site design, it was really looking at opportunities, um, which there weren't too many, to, you know, to create additional housing units. Mm -hmm. So it's really meeting the overall city goals by, you know, creating as many units as possible but, but not overburdening the site. And um, another th another concern that has come up is that um, some of the folks won't be able to afford some of the homes. So could you address that as well, please? Yeah, so I think there's a couple components there. So um, th th this year Habitat uh, for Humanity has um, done initial financial reviews of I think 20 to 25 households. Um, they have not found any households that have gone through that process that didn't qualify from a financial standpoint. Um, so we're not aware of any residents at this time. However, the, um, you'll, 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 you, you would have seen earlier that we're targeting as low as 20% of the AMI. Um, that's to get, for, for those at the lower income, to get housing costs that are similar to what they're paying now. So their, um, their, their pad rents are, I think, 533 per month. Their average repairs through a survey we did is about $75 per month. And their utilities range um, anywhere from $100 to um, $300 per month. Um, so their current housing costs, I think the average is $775 or $780. Um, so we're, we're targeting um, a housing cost with all fees included, including utilities, of about $800. However, for those who have higher incomes at Ponderosa, um, just as our affordable housing program um, is structured now, they would have a higher, higher monthly payment for their home, but they would also have a higher priced home. And that's what creates the diversity of both the AMI um, levels that we're serving, as well as the, the pricing within the community. And, um, and then my final question has to do with um, mentioning you said that people will be able to stay 
in their mobile homes. Could you just talk a little bit about that too, about how that works? Yes, so um, we, we went through a process um, several months ago where we hired an outside um, um, valuation um, person who specializes in mobile homes in Colorado. They walked through every single unit and did a valuation of each um, mobile home. Um, because we're trying to eventually um, uh, transform this community into a fixed foundation community because of the constraints mm -hmm. that I mentioned um, earlier, we're not renewing, we're not bringing in new residents as manufactured home owners into the community. Um, so if they want to stay in place, um, eventually, eventually we will purchase their home. Um, and um, You mean when they're done with it? When, when, if they pass away, yes, we would, we would, it would go to their heirs. Or if they choose um, to, or if they, they choose they to leave, they decide or they want to have a fixed foundation home. Yeah. Then. So if they want a fixed foundation home, we will purchase that home from them for that market value, and they can use that as a down payment on their home, which will also lower their monthly payments. And then um, also um, the same email that we received today was talking about how there are like twelve vacant. Um, uh, mobile homes there and or and or lots um, and um, how do those vacancies work into the whole plan sure so um, initially we didn't have that many vacancies um, when we started this process um, two members of the community have passed away um, and um, and I think it's eight um, families have moved over the last year um, but the intent was um, to start um, in phase one along the left side of the screen there, that's the west side of the property, um, building homes that people could move into um, directly, and then as we create more space in the community, replace those with fixed foundation homes. The challenge now is that um, people haven't left in rows, they've left, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, and, and really to, um, to uh, implement this type of project, we'll have to build homes in sets of four or groups or something like mm -hmm. that. Building, particularly since we're, many of them are duplexes, you can't, you know, it's difficult to build one side of a duplex and then a few years later build the other side of the duplex. So we'll be doing it in groups. But this first phase will allow more space to open up to really redevelop the um, community. And then, I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions, but one more question, and um, I happened to be with you at some of these um, one-on-ones that you um, held, and one of the interesting things that came out of one of the, the meetings was that um, duplexes aren't actually touching walls, and I found that really interesting for several reasons, because there were some concerns from people um, there, particularly the ones we were speaking with, that they didn't want to share walls. And when you went into this explanation, they were like, oh, they felt a lot better about it. So could you just explain for the benefit of everybody here? Yeah, Please. so I think one of the challenges and why they're sensitive to that is that the current homes that they're living in, um, they are almost touching. Um, and so noise actually, and even if they weren't touching, the noise uh, goes through the, that um, home construction type relatively easily. Um, with duplexes, the, um, the homes are actually separated from the foundation all the way up to the roof. Um, and there's, there's insulation between the two and it, be, it becomes sort of a double firewall between the units. So they don't actually um, touch except around the very perimeter of the, of the structure. Um, and so it's very difficult for um, uh, um, sound to resonate from, from one unit to the other. Um, and they'll likely have much better sound control in that situation than they do currently. Thank you. Yep. Aaron. Well, I'll just follow up on that. I've been to a number of events at Ponderosa, and yeah, I live in a townhouse myself, and you never hear anything through the wall, and I've told that to a number of people. Actually, it works out pretty well from a sound perspective. Um, I just wanted to ask again about the uh, Broadway connection. So um, I know when, when this came to us, uh, you know, a while back, we said, look, please keep the Broadway connection, if at all possible, and the traffic engineer said, oh, but it, you have to take it from the lowest category street, and we said, no, please make an exception to that rule and retain the Broadway connection. Now, since then, I understand there are issues with the flood reconstruction, right, of that underpass. Yes. I did notice, however, that in the, the story in the paper about this a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the stated reason from city staff 
for closing the Broadway connection was that it was uh, access needed to be taken from the, the lowest category street. So it seems like messages got mixed up a little bit there um, because we said that it was okay to not do that. But can you clarify, I mean, is, is there any way to keep that Broadway connection open given the revision of the underpass that's being done for flood improvements? So I'm not gonna speak for transportation. Um, Garrett? Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Engineer, and uh, I'm here because we're coordinating the um, the design and construction of the North Broadway reconstruction project between Violet and Highway 36. And um, for those that have experienced our uh, construction projects on major corridors in the city, you happen to uh, know that they're impactful. And knowing the impact that a construction project can create uh, to the adjacent community, uh, and knowing also that the, um, the Four Mile Canyon Creek um, uh, SEEP, was a, which was approved by council, calls for the expansion of the culvert at the Broadway um, Bridge Crossing. Um, we asked our partners and utilities if they would like to take the opportunity while we've got the street under construction to expand the culvert to bring it uh, and bring up um, the, uh, ca the capacity as well as the flood mitigation that's needed for Four Mile Canyon Creek. And so they brought the funding to the project to make that uh, come to fruition. And so, um, what you might envision is uh, if you were to, uh, if, if you were walking or biking along the Four Mile Canyon Creek from west to east, um, what you would see is a doubling of the size of the culvert underneath Broadway. So you would see it moving toward the south from where it is today. And so it uh, is physically impossible to um, pre preserve the access to Ponderosa off of Broadway and put in place the flood mitigation for Four Mile Canyon Creek. And so the timing of why this is uh, uh, coming about now is that we're looking to get North Broadway under construction by the uh, second to third quarter of 2020. And one of the very first work activities that will happen uh, in that project will be the, uh, the, the, the structure work, which will then require the closure of the access uh, uh, at Broadway. And so um, we've got a plan to provide alternate access at 10th and Cherry that the project will put into place um, as a temporary measure. Um, so that is the, the number one reason that we need to, to look at, uh, at, at closing the access. So we also mentioned some secondary and tertiary reasons. Um, you, uh, the, the, the North Broadway subcommunity plan calls for uh, driveway access to be closed. Uh, it is in the city code, we, so we noted that. And then we'd also, uh, as you're probably familiar, that the project has looked at um, some enhancements for being able to accommodate uh, a more a, a safer facility for cyclists. And so um, there was, in fact, a, a, a collision between a vehicle and a cyclist at this very driveway uh, in the last few months. And so we are, uh, we, we've got a, a raised buffered bike lane that will be implemented. And uh, one of the desires when you've got a facility of this type is to reduce vehicle and cyclist conflicts, and those driveway points are one of the highest level, uh, uh, points of conflict that you can experience as a cyclist. And so, uh, again, a secondary tertiary goal uh, here. The number one priority is flood mitigation, uh, preserving the, the, the safety and well-being of, of the community and, and consistent with the Four Mile Canyon Creek seep. Great, Garrett, thank you for that answer. So what I might just ask is, I get that there are other benefits, uh, ter secondary tertiary benefits to it, but fundamentally we're closing the access because of the requirement to do additional flood conveyance, right? So Absolutely. if maybe we can make that clear when um, when we talk to people, uh, I think that'll make it a little bit clearer because I know this, the folks who live there, when I've talked to folks who live there, they're very upset about the closure of the Broadway access. And so I think if we can be clear, look, this is for the safety of you and the other members of the community. And in order to do that, it's really required to turn that access off. So my, I think messaging is important. Understood. Thank you. Um, just one other clarification, I think, um, in terms of what happens to the Carnesseria. Pardon me, Saria. Carnesseria. Uh, sorry, Carnesseria. Can you explain that for the public? Butcher. Is that what it is? Yep. Thank you. Hi, Charles Farrow, Planning Department. So the Carnesseria will be considered uh, a non-conforming use and regulated um, through our non-conforming use review process. So it, it would be able to be expanded, improved over time through a process. It, so it gets to stay and it can expand. Correct. Cool. So, um, yep, anything else? I just ha I have a comment on process, which doesn't really have to do, this is from the planning board minutes. 
um, key issue number three, this is on page 237, and they talk about the OSO, the proposed change to the Boulder Valley Comp Plan land use map, and um, John Gerstel bring, on the planning board brings up that the process it, for changing this land use did not go through OSBT, and I think the chair said it doesn't matter. Um, but I wondered about that process-wise, and wouldn't it be just as a matter of courtesy for that OSO land to be at least reviewed by the Open Space Board of Trustees? Anybody want to speak to that? Do you mean in the future, in these the, types in of the, things? In the future. In the future. Yes, I mean, this is, I, the, the point is, is that it's, it should be consistent rather than sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes it doesn't make any difference. Do you want to speak we're to talking about consistency? OSMP. Sure, OSMP. Chris Meschuk, planning, <coughs> excuse me, planning department. Um, in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, there are multiple land use designations that have the words open space in them. So there's open space acquired and open space development rights. Those are open space land use map designations that apply to city owned open space land or county owned open space land. Open space other has the words open space in it, but it's not city or county owned official designated open space. It really is identifying those environmental corridors along um, creeks and greenways. And so we added some clarification language in the um, comprehensive plan in the last update to try and describe that a little bit further. Um, and so um, in terms of land use map changes, um, th that's the reason it, it's a really a planning board and city council decision making process for land use map changes. Um, in that area. So in the past couple of years, however, a couple of the OSO pieces have come to the Open Space Board of Trustees for, I'm thinking of 311 Mapleton, I'm thinking of the CU South flood mitigation process. So, um, and that doesn't belong to the city either. I mean, so what, the question is when would it be proper for it to go to the open space and when not? or should there be consistency there or should there not? Um, I think in those situations, those were areas that were adjacent to city owned open space. Um, I think in this case related to Ponderosa, there is no adjacency um, or abutment to city um, owned open space. Um, I think your point is a really good one, which is we should be clear on when um, and, and um, th that's a, a, a well taken point. The OSO, for example, al that along 30th Street that's by the Google properties was treated in a, after it came out from underneath the target property and further to the west, um, has been treated as more of an, o an amenity rather than not. And I know that that is something that the OSO properties have been looked at as well prior to this time. So I, I, it'd just be nice, I think, to have some sort of stated policy there. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so in case anybody's not following, I just wanna point out, we, we are talking about this on our consent agenda. We also have a call up on site review for Pond Ponderosa. So if there's any questions related to that site review call up that's coming up momentarily, let us ask them now. Zan, I, think, I believe we're also having a public hearing on this matter for the annexation. Uh, do you know when that's scheduled for? It is October 22nd. October 22nd. So th that will be our chance to have a full public hearing on the matter of Ponderosa and its future. Just pointing that Thank out. you for pointing that out. So is there any more discussions for the site review then tonight in terms of call up? Okay, then going back to our consent agenda. I'd like to move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have talked at length. Anything else to be said? I'll note there's some good third readings on there as well, namely the vaping and the hate crimes. Yes. And um, the transgender uh, uh, language uh, cleanup as well. Yeah, yeah, those are all, I'm very excited about all of those. I just want to uh, mention that uh, the, uh, the Human Relations Commission is already getting to work on the hate crimes ordinance following up and creating some uh, ma written materials that people will be able to learn more about uh, the work we've been doing there. So watch for that. Lots of good work in here. Okay, 
Okay, roll call vote. We start with Council Member Nagel. Aye. Weaver? Aye. Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. Brockett? Aye. Carlisle? Aye. Jones? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Okay, your public hearing for tonight. Oh, oh. no, call ups. Sorry, three of them. Landmark alteration certificate for 845 Pine Street. Does anybody have questions or concerns? I have a question. Okay. Well, is there is um, Mr. James Hewitt? So, so James, we were in the last discussion about Broadway and the culvert and access to Broadway and driveways going into more major uh, transportation arteries, streets. Um, it was noticed how dangerous that is. And I'm wondering whether or not this 845 Pine Street actually does empty into 9th Street, halfway up that 9th Street hill to Mapleton. Hi, James Hewitt, Historic Preservation. Yes, actually there is a curb cut there now, right by the alley, um, providing access to the old garage that's there, you know, the old stone garage. Um, that's on the alley but takes access from 9th Street. What's being proposed is that the curb cut, that curb cut would be vacated and um, located at least 80 feet further to the south, which would provide better um, <clears throat> sight views, sight lines, when you're coming, coming from the north, coming down the hill, because that's really, I guess, the issue in terms of and I'm speaking for David Thompson now. Um, the issue is as cars come over the top of that hill, um, there isn't a good sight line. And so if you're someone's backing out or driving out onto 9th Street, it, it, you know, it can cause some, some dangerous. Are you talking about from the alley? No, I'm talking about from 9th Street. From 9th Street. Yeah. So I mean the alley that intersects. So there's an alley that goes along Farmer's Ditch that's just to the north of this property, That's correct? That's right, yes. And before this building construction started, there wasn't, in my memory at any rate, a curb cut that was being used along 9th Street. But when the construction started, there were trucks coming in and out of there. And I was by there just today and the curb cut is still there. So my question is whether or not that's intended to be permanent. Um, there will be a permanent curb cut in roughly that location. That curb cut was just provided for the construction, which is, is so, underway. So, so since we're talking about bicycle safety in the transportation issue as well as other pedestrian, et cetera, that hill is one where it, bikes going south from the top go really fast uh. because of the grade on that hill. And I would discourage any, I can't think of any other um, curb cuts going into 9th Street along its almost entirety like that one does do in such a dangerous spot. I'm just noting, noting that. Um, particularly, as I say, since it hasn't been used in that way in times past, to be adding it now with the increase in traffic, particularly on 9th Street, I find to be really par problematic. So that's just a comment. Thank you. And I don't know what the council wants, if anything, to, I mean, <clears throat> do we sort of contradictory? The only other thing could be to move the, the shed, the stone house up above, right, that's on the alley and use that as some kind of, or, and which reminds the other part of the question was, I thought that in the historic districts that Two car garages were um, not the thing that would be looked for, but rather one car. And I noted that this is gonna be a one and a half car, but it's also <laughs> noted as a two car. Yeah, what was, uh, what was reviewed was a two car garage. Um, a condition of the approval was to reduce it to one and a half, which is really a one car garage with some storage space. And the garage that's there now is, is just not functional um, as a garage. Right. And you know, it's, it's dangerous too, just because of the location right at the top of the hill there. 
So it's getting slightly less dangerous. Slightly, yeah. yeah. It's, I just noted, you know, we're having the, the things that we heard before and we're gonna have this transportation master plan following. This is really poor planning. Any other questions or concerns? Does anybody wanna call this up? Okay. Okay, landmark alteration certificate for 1900 King Avenue. Does anybody have questions, want to discuss, want to call up? Okay. Okay, site review for 4475 Broadway, Ponderosa. So we just talked about Ponderosa, so I hope nobody has any more questions on that. Okay. Okay, your public hearing is items related to the 2019 transportation master plan. Thank you, right up. I'll go ahead and get started while they're setting up the presentation. Um, I'm Kathleen Brackey. I'm the Go Boulder Manager and the Interim Co-Director of Transportation along with my colleague Bill Cowron. Um, we're here tonight on behalf of the Transportation Division and really appreciate the opportunity to share with you the 2019 Transportation Master Plan for your consideration. Um, this is an exciting milestone for us to be at this evening and the result of an 18 month journey with the community um, to get here. Um, along with us this evening is uh, uh, Bill Rigler, the chair of the Transportation Advisory Board, who will also be sharing some comments from the board as part of our presentation. And in addition, I just wanna acknowledge the staff team that's worked so hard on this project for this many months, including Randall Rutsch, uh, Amy Lewin, Chris Haglin, Jean Sanson, uh, DK Kemp, and also um, our colleagues from uh, uh, the Capital Projects Group, Garrett's team, and also um, our maintenance team um, with Callie Hayden and her team. So it's truly been a team effort across transportation and also across the city organization. Um, also with us this evening is Commander Kerry Yamaguchi from the police department, so he's here as well, and um, certainly a great partnership with transportation and the police department, particularly on our Vision Zero safety initiatives. So we'll go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, I, as we dive in to the topic this evening, um, I also wanna thank the council members and the Transportation Advisory Board members for all of your work and all of your help throughout the planning process. We had many um, community events and walking events and forums, and your participation throughout was very instrumental in helping us to learn from the community and incorporate the community feedback um, into the updated plan. If we go to the... The next slide. Um, the other part that I think is really important in terms of setting the stage for this evening is the the um, long legacy of planning for the Boulder community and with the Boulder community. Um, tonight actually represents the 30th anniversary of transportation master planning in the community. So the first TMP was um, developed by the Boulder community in 1989. So it's a great legacy and a great um, uh, shoulders to stand on of all of the people who have worked so hard for so many years to create the amazing transportation system that we have today. And it's very exciting to be here tonight to be planning for today and for the next 30 years uh, for the community so that we can continue that strong tradition and foundation of a multimodal system that's safe and sustainable and connects people of all ages and stages of life. So thank you again for the opportunity and we're very excited to be here tonight. So I'll turn it over to Randall. Uh, Randall Rutsch, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, so you can see on the wall the items that we're going to cover tonight. We'll give a brief summary of our community engagement and comments received, a brief orientation to the TMP document itself, and then really focus on the 10 key initiatives that are contained in the plan, uh, highlighting the three signs shown on the screen. And then, of course, we have uh, the public hearing and your consideration of the motions in front of you. And so this just shows um, the organization of the plan as part of this update. Um, we took the opportunity to fundamentally reorganize and to uh, build a plan into three sections. Uh, the first section is really the background, talking about history, policies, and process. 
And then the second section is the 10 key initiatives, and we'll be talking more about those. Those are really the heart of the document. And the last section is talking about um, how we move forward in terms of the funding and the measurement of progress and a call to action. And so as, you, as we work through this, you'll see for each of the 10 initiatives that they're presented in a consistent way. So we talk about why each is important, the key challenges involved with each, and then the key actions. And the plan is highly graphical, it's meant to be user-friendly, accessible, easy to find things, and to really focus on those things that we need to do in the 10 initiatives. So since the 2014 plan, we've had a longer vision statement, some of which is shown here. We really say that we want a safe, accessible, sustainable transportation system. And then we have to thank our uh, Transportation Advisory Board member, uh, Mark McIntyre, for the bullet points really summarizing what this means, and you can see those there. And then a reminder in that first section that we also have policies uh, related to the plan. There are 22 policies. Uh, these are very consistent with the last update of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. Uh, we've added a new section on advanced mobility and electric vehicles, and uh, we've, we're planning uh, to integrate those in our community, help them meet our broader community goals. That really means that they be clean, connected, and shared. And then, as you know from previous uh, times with you, that we've been engaged in a very active and continuous public process since the March, 8th, March uh, 2018 kickoff event. A lot of the heavy lifting of that's really been done by our uh, two citizen uh, working groups, the Pet Advisory Committee and the Funding Working Group. Uh, we've al also been engaged in a very diverse outreach to stakeholders, uh, probably about 40 presentations, including uh, talking with youth, seniors, and uh, the EFA organization and their clients. Most recently, we've done a farmer's market event on August 21st, and then had the September 5th, 13th Street Greenway dedication and celebration. And all these activities are contained in a summary of community engagement that is available on the TMP update website. And so with that, just gonna talk a bit about what we've heard. Uh, the first section mm -hmm. is contained in the plan, and this is really what we've heard throughout the process. And so as you can see here, uh, we've heard a lot about safety, concerns with walking and biking. Uh, citizens certainly recognize the relationship between light use <coughs> and transportation. And we saw very strong support in terms of our greenhouse gas reduction efforts, as evidenced in one of the questions of the month that we did on Be Heard Boulder. And then uh, citizens also recognize that uh, RTD has been cutting service and that we need to work to improve that. Again, uh, safety is important in terms of how we choose to travel. Congestion is a concern. We see that reflected in our increasing vehicle <coughs> counts over the last few years. And then we need to prepare for new technologies, use them to shape and help us reach our community goals. And then finally, people certainly recognize that funding is critical and we need to do more to maintain and operate our system. And so then for the public review draft, uh, we've seen very similar kinds of comments. I won't go through these, but again, uh, lots of concern with safety, requests for improvements at specific locations, um, land use integration, and then people noting that uh, for many folks, they do need to use the car for some of their trips and they're noticing the congestion. Um, also lots of compliments in terms of the layout uh, presentation of the plan itself. And so just to remind you, um, the copy that you received in your packet had all the changes highlighted from the public review draft. The memo also um, highlights some significant changes that we made, and we'll uh, talk about some of those specifically related to uh, some of the speeding issues as we go through the remainder of the presentation. So with that, turn it over to Amy. Amy Lewin, Senior Transportation Planner. <coughs> um, as Randall mentioned, um, the 10 key initiatives are really the heart of the document. And for each of these, um, there are some key next steps, the actions that are associated with them. And so as we go through these next slides, you're gonna see a lot of actions on them. Um, tonight, I'm just gonna be highlighting a few of them. 
and um, we do have staff here happy to talk about any of these in more detail after the presentation. So I'll go through them fairly quickly. Um, the first one, again, um, travel safety being really, really important to the community. Um, travel safety is really under the umbrella of uh, Vision Zero, and I'll talk a little more about the safe street support in just a second. Um, the reason why this particular action is highlighted is it's an example of a recent change that we made based on community input and input from TAB related to managing vehicle speeds, which has been a, a topic of interest. And more specifically, at our TAB meeting last week, um, TAB was supportive of the plan and recommended this particular change um, to that action item. So we will be incorporating this change into the document uh, before finalizing. So in June, we brought uh, the draft safe streets report to you all, um, and uh, you offered support and some suggestions, which we've incorporated. And just by way of context, of course, our Vision Zero approach is holistic. It involves all four E's of engineering, education, enforcement, and evaluation. And this Safe Streets Report is really one of the fundamental efforts related to evaluation. So as a reminder of what's inside that, um, well, the first thing is evaluating what we've been done to date, uh, we've done to date to learn from that. Um, the, ma the majority of the report focuses on our severe crashes. These are the crashes that are resulting in serious injuries and occasionally fatalities. And then it all culminates in the Vision Zero Action Plan towards the end of the document. 50 action items that are really a comprehensive to-do list um, related to all aspects of travel safety. So uh, one area that's been in the news lately is 30th Street. So we wanted to give a little update on that. We actually have some near-term improvements that are planned over the next two years, including green pavement markings and a protected intersection and two underpasses at 30th and Colorado. Now, we also recently completed um, a study of both the 30th Street and Colorado Avenue corridors um, that recommend separated or protected bike lanes throughout. So um, those will be implemented as funding is available. Hey, can you just pause and, and yeah. tell everybody what a protected intersection is just so the, the public knows what that means? Sure. So um, a protected intersection, and you can kind of see a, dra a draft of one over here, um, it's, it's actually going to um, have some uh, concrete at the corners, for example, to slow down uh, the, the turning speed of vehicles, and it's gonna have, um, you can see like a little extra green paint there, and really some <coughs> extra waiting areas for cyclists and pedestrians um, to cross in a way that will uh, shorten the crossing distance and the exposure for them and slow vehicle traffic in general. Thank you. Kind of a quick summary. Great. So the next initiative is related to comfort. And um, the big idea here really is our low stress walk and bike network plan. Um, this is our low stress bike network map. Um, it's really a citywide network of facilities on which people of all ages and abilities will feel comfortable. And so you'll see the different colors on here represent different facility types. And the facility types will vary depending upon the context of the area, the available right of way, et cetera. The concept is that it's all connected throughout the city. And one of the example um, uh, no, facility types is our neighborhood Green Street. Um, and that's typically a lower traffic corridor that's prioritized for walking and biking. And Randall mentioned we had our ribbon cutting of our very first corridor, 13th Street, um, earlier in the month. And so what you'll see there now is signing, striping, and um, also soon art, thanks to a collaboration with Casey Middle School. So another key initiative is really about providing options, providing different choices, and some of our actions really focus on transit, like expanding the hop and implementing our um, renewed vision for transit, as well as micromobility and the use of e-bikes and things like that. Another key initiative is prioritizing the pedestrian, and um, really that is detailed in the 2019 pedestrian plan. Uh, this was our first substantial update in over 20 years, 
and I have to call out the great support of our pedestrian advisory committee, we call them the PAC. Um, this is a community-based committee um, that uh, attended meetings throughout the planning process, walkabouts, we even had webinars. Um, they've substantially contributed to the plan. Uh, several members are here tonight. I think they're still here. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been wonderful to work with them and I shared their endorsement letter with you via email um, earlier today. So what's inside the pedestrian plan? Um, it's organized in a manner uh, fairly similar to the TMP with the first section being an introduction with history, um, a data snapshot, and a summary of um, how things work today. Um, that kind of culminates into our key findings in the second section. And really the third section is our path forward. It's the vision and goals, best practices, and really our initiatives and specific action items. The last section helps us um, work towards implementation and monitor prog progress. So our vision is that everyone enjoys being a pedestrian in Boulder for all types of trips. Um, and you can see our goals there. These were developed uh, with the support of the PAC and the community and really guided the development of the plan. So we've identified some immediate priorities. I'm um, not going to read all of these, but the idea is that some of these initiatives have actually already started, or we will be starting them as soon as tomorrow. Um, so we're, we'd like to continue a community-based uh, committee. We're going to update our pedestrian crossings. And then another big idea, of course, is that low-stress walk network. So this map, uh, you saw a version of this, an early version in June, um, and this identifies the areas that we propose to focus improvements in. Um, the green are the pedestrian improvement areas and the yellow are the neighborhood Green Street corridors. So these areas will be studied further um, to, and uh, identify de improvements, design them and implement those improvements. The focus is on making it easier to walk and roll to our daily destinations. So jumping back to the TMP initiatives, just have a few more. Um, transportation is changing, and so one of our challenges is how to harness that in a way that meets our goals. And so in terms of innovation, um, we're looking at how to incorporate more EVs, um, how to manage our curbs, and I'm pleased to announce that we just uh, received word that we were awarded a grant uh, to support a curbside management study as well as some uh, improvements for uh, pedestrian and, cross and cyclist crossings um, through Dr. Cog. Um, so for those of you involved in those committees, that will be going to the TAC um, next week and to the board and next month. So could, could you just say another, say another couple of words about the curbside management, what that, translate that? Yeah. Um, so essentially, it's really looking at the curb as um, and public right of way as an asset to manage. Um, we've got a lot of things like Uber and Lyft, for example, we've heard are stopping in the middle of streets. Um, so is there a way where we can designate areas um, to encourage people to um, more safely access services like that? And, are, and there's a lot more to it. That's one, one example. But like bus pullout. <clears throat> bus pullout areas would be an example. Could be, yes. All sorts of uses like that. Yeah, really taking, taking a dedicated look at, look and, at and that. And freight as well. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> um, freight as well. Yes. And so the first step of the project <clears throat> will be a detailed inventory of the curb to really understand what we have and then to work with the TNCs to actively manage loading zones so they can do that safely. And then potentially, um, a lot of people in the industry are saying dynamic pricing of the curb, which could involve reservations, real-time reservation system, as well as pricing, um, is the next billion dollar industry in transportation. So we're trying to keep <laughs> up with that. Yeah, heard it here. <laughs> and uh, are you also, will that include maybe looking at sticks kind of in the form of, say, ticketing people who stop in the middle of Broadway to pick up or drop off people? It potentially could. Um, you know, we have looked, there are people out there in terms of startups that are actually, as an example, using data from the TNCs themselves, from Uber and Lyft, and they can then monitor where those people stop and potentially provide penalties if they stop in inappropriate places. Great. Well, it's good news about the grant uh, at the Dr. Cog meetings. When I go there, I look forward to supporting it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. 
So the next initiative is related to transit. Um, and uh, for example, the potential to have the city take on more control over transit and also expanding our partnerships with uh, Boulder County and others in the Northwest part of the region. And speaking of region, um, we know that there are a lot of people coming in and out of Boulder in all directions. And so um, how do we build those regional corridors, building off the success of the multimodal aspect of US 36, for example? And another approach uh, to providing options is really managing our demand. So an example of this is expanding the EcoPass program and actually working towards a potential fare-free transit. Um, so again, this involves a variety of strategies and partnerships. And it's really important to make sure that the system works for everyone and that it really serves all members of the community. Um, so one example of an initiative that we've been working on here is that community-wide equity index that we actually incorporated into the prioritization process for <coughs> TMP projects in the investment program analysis. So um, we're gonna continue to evaluate and refine that. And with that, I'll turn it over oh. to Chris Haglin to talk about funding and more. I have a quick question regarding the um, community-wide equity index that you referred to. Um, how was that applied, say for example, the connectivity map that you showed with the different colors um, for Green Streets and um, on street access? And how, how was that applied to that particular map, say for example? So, so it was applied in the sense that um, physical projects, CIP projects are represented in that map. And so all of the projects from the low stress bike and ped network have been incorporated into the TMP project list that added over 600 projects. And then we evaluate all those projects through the tool as a starting point, knowing that we have a CIP process, we have a budget process, we will continue to use the tool um, with guidance from council to help us do that. Okay, thank you. All right, good evening. Uh, Chris Haglund, Senior Transportation Planner. And tonight I'll be covering the areas of funding and measurable objectives. And then I'll also be providing some additional information that over the last couple weeks, council has requested uh, in regard to the funding arena. Um, the linchpin for implementing these key initiatives that Amy just went over uh, in the Transportation Master Plan is funding. Um, the TMP emphasizes the need for new sources of local and regional funding. Uh, these new funding sources need to be predictable, reliable, scalable, and sustainable over time to meet existing and future needs. Uh, and finally, we need to start focusing on user fees, those that provide a viable revenue source uh, for our multimodal corridors to manage performance and also to induce travel behavior change. And of also, uh, we need that uh, need these new mechanisms to address social and economic equity issues. Uh, our key investment themes include safety, maintaining our infrastructure, mobility, equity, the climate, and air quality. These high priority, uh, priority themes are reflected in all levels of our TMP investment programs, from our current funding, through our strategic investment program, to our vision plan, but really vary depending on the availability of funds. These key investments are also aligned with our investment priorities that are found in the TMP. Um, the 2019 needs assessment identified significant unmet needs within the city's key services. Uh, this chart shows both unmet annual needs as well as one-time capital needs. The assessment identified approximately $23 million in annual unfunded essential services needs and an additional $21 million in one-time capital costs that are primarily related to hop electrification and broadband improvements for trans, uh, traffic operations. Chris, before you go on here, can I ask a question about <clears throat> the uh, EcoPass, so you've got 1.3 million under planning and programs, Vision Zero and EcoPass. So how does that break down? What isn't funded? Um, uh, the exact breakdown, uh, I would say for the EcoPass, it's probably um, 200, 250,000 dollars in additional funds, and that is related to the right pricing formulas that have now been instituted by RTD for both the business, the neighborhood, 
programs. Uh, so we provide rebates and subsidies to those programs. So we anticipate those going up significantly. Um, you know, just in the neighborhood program, we have a large uh, portion of those neighborhoods that are going to be fully right priced and it's gonna be doubling their contracts. Okay, and then for the local transit service, is that additional routes we'd like to buy up from RTD or what, what's that, that? That's essentially backfilling some of the loss in service that we've experienced <coughs> from RTD. Okay. So, th so that's maintaining. Yeah, that is to backfill and to maintain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, our, thank our you. Level of service. Yep. Sure thing. Um, next slide. Uh, we we certainly understand the difficulty uh, that council uh, is facing in these funding issues, uh, especially in light of the collective needs that we've heard around the city, uh, and as well as the impact of any new taxes or fees that. Uh, we'll have in our community. Um, staff also understands that council may wish to address transportation's unfunded needs as part of a more holistic uh, citywide initiative as well, uh, and we are prepared to uh, engage in that activity as well. What this chart represents are the TMP investment levels uh, with the orange circle representing our current funding, which is that is an 11 year average of our projected revenue under our current funding sources, about $39 million. The subset of the green uh, circle, that represents our current funding plus the $23 million in unmet annual needs and the $21 million in the one-time capital costs. Chris, real quick question. Yes. Um, the $39 million a year, is that taking into consideration the um, 0.15 that just, that was passed in 2013 that is now going to be transferred over from open space? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that is part of the 11 year projection. That okay, have. thank you. Um, the, uh, the larger green circle, that adds in the renewed vision for transit, uh, the fully implemented Vision Zero Action Plan, uh, some greenhouse gas reduction programs, and that what is what in, in total comp comprises our strategic investment program. The yellow circle, that represents our vision level assessment, and that's essentially the cost when adding in the 1,200 capital improvement projects that are included into our, in our transportation well, master plan. Next one, please. Uh, in June, staff presented six funding mechanisms that were identified by the funding working group and staff structured in a tiered uh, approach that is phased in over time. Um, to reiterate, there is no silver, silver bullet to solve our funding issues, so our approach needs to be layered to include both local and regional funding, local funding to take care of our system, um, our infrastructure, and regionally we know that RTD cannot provide the service that we need. Uh, we're gonna have to have both local and transit service, uh, the local and regional transit service uh, funded with new, with new ways. Um, it, um, at our June meeting, uh, council did direct staff to continue to pursue these identified mechanisms uh, for possible implementation or a ballot initiative in 2020, and we are working on that. Next, please. Um, so following the adoption of the TMP the fund and, and the funding approach, staff will continue to work internally uh, with our technical team and also externally with our stakeholders and uh, a renewed community working group uh, to further analyze and design the tier one and tier two mechanisms. Um, one of the more immediate needs if pursuing a local transportation fee would be to conduct a nexus study, uh, which identifies how revenues from a fee can be spent. Um, staff is also, as I said earlier, prepared to work within any citywide uh, funding analysis as well. What we'd like to do is as we move on with these funding mechanisms, uh, fleshing them out and designing them, we expect to return quarterly uh, to both uh, to boards and council uh, for key policy direction uh, as these mechanisms are designed. And now uh, on to some of the um, uh, recent request for information. So in regard to Vision Zero, uh, we were asked to provide some additional information on current uh, 2019 funding, funding and 2020 funding. So we've broken this down into indirect, direct, and police-related categories. 
Um, really, you could argue that almost everything we do in transportation can be related to safety, uh, from street sweeping to filling potholes and everything. So uh, the indirect portions really represent anything from the you know proportions of, of street sweeping, maintaining signs, striping. Um, so those are all included in the uh, indirect. The direct costs are really those that are associated directly with the Vision Zero Action Plan um, and programs around the four E's and the Neighborhood Speed Management Program. Um, the real difference between the 2019 uh, indirect costs and 2020 indirect costs is that the 2019 costs included the funds for 30th and Colorado and North Broadway. So that's why you have a significant difference between 2019 and 2020. Uh, for the direct cost, that was really a one-time budget adjustment uh, due to a, some additional uh, sales tax revenue that in 2019 was put, put towards um, Vision Zero funding. Uh, the police funding, um, just a, a slight increase, uh, likely due to just cost labor personnel increases. And sorry, um, I, and for the police, can you, or is that, is that an allocation? I didn't quite follow how this that, applies that to is, safety, transportation you know, what, safety. What they have estimated is spent on safety, vision zero safety related. Like speed enforcement? Enforcement typically would be that. Okay. Um, I'm sure uh, if we have our, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the back if yeah. you need any clarification on that. I think that's good. But, uh, I thought I was listening, but the difference between 2019 and 2020 on indirect and direct is that you said North Broadway went into 2019? Yeah, the funds are accounted for in our 2019 budget. And 30th and, and 30th. 30th okay. in Colorado and North Broadway. Okay, thank you. And, and the, we just had a, a $100,000 bump uh, yeah. in 2019. Is there a breakdown anywhere of, of what the police costs are? Like how much for patrol, how much for whatever? Uh, I don't whatever? have those. I don't know if the commander could speak to those. Just, to, just as curiosity. Um, All right, good evening. Kerry Yamaguchi with the police department. I can't, uh, I didn't, uh, I don't have those numbers exactly. I can tell you that the traffic section of the traffic unit for the police department uh, currently consists of 11 officers, uh, two sergeants, and four accident report specialists. And so I'm, I would assume that those costs are those uh, positions uh, uh, by and large. Uh, what it may also include are the photo enforcement uh, portion of the, of the program. Uh, which includes one supervisor, uh, four operators, van operators, and two uh, part-time uh, process servers class uh, slash uh, analysts. Um, again, I can't give you the specifics, but I'm, I'm assuming that's where those numbers are drawn from. Okay. So, so I guess back to the larger costs, considering that these are safety issues that you plan on expanding, have you done an assessment of what kinds of these police costs are going to be paid for by the TMP? Um, I, I do not have that uh, information. I don't know if any of my colleagues do. So as we're developing the action items, then we would be looking at the holistic costs for transportation, police, there might be other departments or other um, other agency costs as well. So that'll be part of, as we refine this, we've just identified at a high level the current cost estimates for the action plan, but okay. there may be additional information needed as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, next slide. Um, we were also asked about our, our capital improvement program. So the 2020 to 25 capital improvement program, there is a local investment of approximately $70 million over that time frame, with $9 million in leveraged federal funds. This breaks down approximately into $30 million spent on capital reconstruction and enhancement projects and $48 million in multimodal capital maintenance and enhancement projects. And I know Garrett uh, Slater is here and can speak to those if you have any specific questions. Um, in regard to the city's pavement maintenance program, um, 
the chart on the, the lower left shows uh, whether we're kind of meeting our overall condition index or OCI of 75, which is our policy, or dipping below it. Um, so you can see from 2011 to 2014, we were able to meet the OCI target of 75. We dipped in 2016 and 2017 and rebounded in 18. But I think the, the big picture is that based on increased costs, uh, construction materials, declining purchasing power, we anticipate that our ability to maintain a 75 OCA, uh, OCI will decrease uh, without additional funding for roadway maintenance. Can I ask about that? There, sure. Is there, um, is that diagram of the streets and what uh, level they're at in the in the TMP somewhere? Or it, it, where? No, this this is not in the TMP, but I believe that it is listed on our website relative to the pavement management program. So okay, so you could find it there because yes. that it'd be interesting to look in at all those because I mean I certainly know I occasionally I pass those that are at that failing serious or failing grade, yes. and so. Um, It'd be good to see that map. And, and, and the bars that you see there come from our um, dashboard. And so that is monitored there and you can see the change over time, dipped a bit into the red, made it back into the green this last year. Did you? Yeah. Yes. And so a couple of weeks ago, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I was asking a question about um, uh, potholes and, and refilling potholes. Is it um, once it, a street falls below the OCI rating ranking, is it, um, does it actually become more expensive to maintain? Well, certainly uh, there's a point at which you have to reconstruct a road rather than resurface it, and that comes at a significantly greater cost. The OCI of 75 is an aggregate score for the whole system. Okay. So you know you're going to have some that are just redone that are going to be very high, mm -hmm. and others that are in the queue to get redone that are going to be low. But we shoot for an overall OCI of 75. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know the exact <coughs> number of which then it needs to be reconstructed, but probably. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, under, I guess my question is, is um, me, the more, the longer we wait to actually um, maintain the ranking higher, um, it will actually cost us more because the degradation will be higher. That's correct. So there's a, a, a pavement degradation curve that we um, pay very close attention to with each of our streets that goes into this OCI ranking because once it starts to get below, and the OCI ranking is a condition rating from zero to 100, and so once a street gets below 50, it accelerates the rate at which it degrades down to a zero. So we strive very hard to keep our streets all at that uh, 70 and above because that, that puts them in the fair, good, and excellent condition rating. Um, and so when they're in those upper categories, we can do minimal maintenance and preserve their life at much lower cost. I like to say that uh, when we can go through and do crack seals, then we're talking about one zero. When we're doing chip seals, then we add another zero. When we do mill and overlays, we add another zero. And when we have to totally rebuild the street, we add another zero. And so we like to keep the zeros uh, as, as small as possible. And so we wanna maintain the system uh, at the, and the OCIs at the higher level. Um, one of the factors that contributes to why, uh, when you take a closer look at this map, why we might be deferring some of the maintenance is uh, we partner very closely with the folks in utilities water um, distribution as they go through and upgrade their water mains. We don't want to be repaving streets right before they're going to tear them up and put a water main in. So sometimes we will sit on a street that we know is uh, decaying and we would really like to be able to jump on it to pave it, but we have to wait until that water main is replaced. And so um, then we work with our friends on the, the maintenance side on the routine uh, uh, so maintenance. Uh, and so they can go out and do patching and potholing and try to keep it together so that it doesn't completely degrade. And so when you do that, are you cost sharing with um Yes, every, uh, yes, water, the, the yeah. utilities does cost share on the, on the street paving. Thank you. Right. So the map that you have up here, the 2018, is that you, what you're saying is that there is a more current um, rating on the website? The 2018 is the most current, so we don't, up, we update the map yearly. <laughs> 
and we don't update the map until we finish the yearly maintenance activities. And so we are in the process right now of going through all of the, the overlays and the concrete repairs and the, the, the uh, crack ceiling. So as we get into November, then we'll update the map um, for 2019 and we'll publish that to the website. I just wondered, the colors look a little different, I think, as Mary noted, from maybe what Aaron, that they are on the ground. Um, and I wondered also, if you let people in the area, if the streets are in fairly deteriorated condition and you're waiting on utilities, do you let people in the area know that you know you're gonna be, we're queuing you up, but we've gotta wait for this other thing to happen first? Uh, let's, so you're saying are we proactive in letting yes. them know the reason yes. why? Yes, um, communicating. With some folks we have, but I would say that we haven't been as consistent about that. It's a good suggestion that we should take into our uh, public public engagement activities uh, for, for letting folks know. It, it would probably create some goodwill. Sure. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Gary. All right. Um, for the 2020 budget, uh, transportation has asked for an additional uh, $600,000 in funding uh, with uh, $150,000 going to our snow and ice program. This will expand our anti-icing practices and also expand our multi-use path plowing with an additional plow driver. Uh, also $350,000 dedicated to median and right-of-way maintenance. Uh, this money would be used to maintain a, a, a essentially the equivalent of an additional 41 acres at a higher level of service uh, for our high priority sites across the city, and $100,000 for street maintenance. This will increase the number of potholes filled from approximately 1,700 a year to 2,000, uh, and also increase funding for some of our minor patching. So once again, to help keep those OCI ratings up. Um, if there is any new arising opportunity for any additional one-time money in 2020, uh, this is how we would propose uh, expending that money. Uh, money for, uh, additional money for maintenance, evenly split between our routine and capital maintenance activities. Uh, additional funding for electric hop uh, local match money and also uh, increased investments in our Vision Zero Action Plan, our low stress network, and our neighborhood speed management program. And now we return back to our TMP. <laughs> um, so this document um, also outlines the measurable objectives that we use to monitor and evaluate our progress towards meeting our community goals. Um, so we collect and analyze uh, multiple sources of data to track this prog progress. This includes uh, travel surveys of residents and employees, vehicle count, bicycle count, transit ridership, intersection, travel time, crash, and census data. Um, the first three focus areas, uh, or first three measurable objectives, focus on tracking changes uh, in vehicle miles of travel, in greenhouse gas emissions, and modal shift. And then in addition to those, uh, the other uh, measurable objectives are related to vision zero and safety, uh, providing mobility for all and our vulnerable populations, uh, increasing transportation options for residents and employees, maintain, maintaining travel time and creating walkable neighborhoods. Um, we use these non measurable <coughs> objectives to track uh, trends over time and focus on areas where uh, progress is needed. Um, we report this in our biannual report on progress, um, and that provides much more details and also a summary report card. We will be producing a new report on progress in 2020, and one of the important highlights of that report on progress will be the 25th anniversary of the Neighborhood EcoPass program. So moving forward after TMP adoption, our division's focus uh, are really on safety and funding. Uh, for safety, it's about implementing our, our Vision Zero Action Plan, uh, continuing installation of neighborhood green streets, and working on our neighborhood speed management program. For funding, it's continuing the technical and policy analyst, uh, uh, analyst um, analysis needed for um, fleshing out those mechanisms, working with the funding uh, working group, and developing recommendations to council uh, for potential local and regional funding initiatives in 2020. Um, this funding is critical. 
uh, to meet the community's vision for transportation, to address climate change, and meet the key initiatives of the transportation master plan. In addition, we'll work on expanding hop service and pursue full electrification of the hop, uh, accelerate our negotiations with RTD to achieve our renewed vision for transit, and also develop a web-based version of the TMP to maintain a living document for continued uh, engagement with our community. Uh, prior to coming to council for TMP adoption, staff presented the TMP to the Environmental Advisory Board, uh, the Transportation Advisory Board, and Planning Board. Uh, in short, uh, the EAB, EAB supports the TMP adoption. Uh, both TAB and Planning Board unanimously recommend that council adopt the TMP. Uh, TAB did add the one am amendment that was uh, mentioned earlier on controlling vehicle speeds. Uh, staff has modified the TMP to include that action. Uh, and just once again, I'd like to thank you, you know, for your time and consideration. Uh, there are difficult decisions uh, to be made ahead. Um, but now I'd like to invite Bill Riggler, uh, the chair of TAB, to provide some additional comments. Good evening, council. Good evening, staff. Um, I'm Bill Riggler, Chairman of the Transportation Advisory Board. I'm joined with uh, t tonight by Alex Weinheimer and Mark McIntyre of TAB. I uh, would like to recognize them for their service, uh, along with Tia Duhaim and Johnny Drozdek, who unfortunately could not be here. Um, about two weeks ago, we got the news, as I'm sure many of you did, about the, the, the young girl who had been hit by a car uh, while going to school. And we have that woman's father, Mr. Uh, Michael Tompkins, who will be here later on to talk during the public comment. We'd also received a very compelling uh, talk from a nine-year-old named Sabrina Halsey, who unfortunately could not be here tonight due to it being past her bedtime. <laughs> um, but out of respect for yours, I'll be, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, it's been a singular privilege for TAB to have played a role in helping shepherd through uh, the transportation master plan over these last 18 months. Um, I, in particular, want to recognize both Bill Cowan and Kathleen Brackey, who, in addition to their day jobs, have also served as the acting co-directors of the transportation division. It's been a Herculean effort, and I just I want to thank them uh, just from the bottom of my heart for all the work that they've done. It's, it's, they've been fantastic partners throughout. Um, our understanding is that the transportation master plan uh, has gone farther in terms of um, public engagement than any other master planning process so far. We have held dozens and dozens of public meetings, reached out to thousands and thousands of individuals online through social media, through the Daily Camera, through KGNU, through Nextdoor, through newsletters, through the city's publication. And, and so on. And we hope that our work here can be a model for what future public engagement efforts can look like for, for master planning processes. Um, in addition, we've also had the opportunity to work very closely with the Boulder Chamber of Commerce, with community cyclists, with Cyclists for Community, with the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and many more to help shape our, our views. And each one of those perspectives, we hope and strongly believe, is, is represented in, in the recommendations made here. Uh, the 20 time, 2030 timeline that's been discussed in terms of bringing together our climate action uh, goals along with the TMP, we feel uh, reflects the urgency that we've heard from council and as Randall shared earlier with the general public through the community input, that the time is now for bold action on climate and that the need uh, has never been greater to look more closely at transportation, smart land use and um, uh, and climate change, and so we feel that the TMP does a very, very good job of helping us get to those. Uh, a couple of final points, we fully support the Vision Zero focus, and we want to emphasize the need to reduce, reduce vehicle speeds on both arterials and local streets to make walking and bike riding safe and comfortable for all people. We also support the other emphasis, uh, uh, the other areas of emphasis of the TMP, such as making walking and biking safe and comfortable, implementing the renewed vision for transit as refined through the um, transit service delivery study and reducing air pollution and green greenhouse gas emissions. And maybe just a, a final comment, um, Council Member Carlisle, I know that you had the opportunity to work on the first TMP 30 years ago. We hope that you will agree in three decades of TMPs, this is the best and most comprehensive TMP that you've ever seen. Thank you. No. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. I chaired the first transportation um, master plan committee and it is interesting to see how far you've come and how we're still hitting the same themes and have added a few and how much work there is yet to be done. Indeed. But it's hopeful to see all of this, this effort and energy and enthusiasm put in it.
So it's really hopeful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Okay, and with that, uh, staff is available uh, mm -hmm. for questions from council. So I'm sure we have questions. I will note that we've had a steady trickle of people leave and we might want to um, get to our public hearing sooner rather than later. Um, is that all right? Yeah, I have, I have lots of questions, but I'm happy to hear from the public before asking them. Is that okay? Okay. So, yes, we'll have questions, but how many people do we have signed up? We have eight people. Eight people. Okay, you get three minutes apiece. Spence Havlick. What an honor to have you back here, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Thank you for your service, past, present, and future. Want to give a big shout out to the uh, Pedestrian Advisory Committee team, the 18 of us that have met for a full year with Amy at the helm. Uh, one of the people behind the scenes who doesn't get much credit is Randall Rush. He's been crunching numbers for 32 years, if I can remember properly. Not, not quite that long. It seems that long. So uh, hats off to um, the folks that have put this together and you have an incredible staff that really did the heavy lifting. I do have three points that have not appeared in the PAC recommendations or in the TMC. I'm wanting to lay it on council's table. The first is to consider a 15 mile an hour speed limit in school zones, in areas where seniors and uh, young people or where there's heavy pedestrian activity. 20 miles an hour is currently in place for school zones and work zones. And we all know that it is probably exceeded by at least four to seven miles per hour. There are two cities in Colorado that have it in place and it's been very successful. Crested Butte and Buena Vista. I think we could do it here. The second suggestion I make to council, and you have the power to do this even beside what all of us have recommended, is to consider a few car-free zones. Think of the favorite places in Boulder where all of us love and enjoy being safe and comfortable. They are car-free. One of them is the Boulder Creek Path, and the other is the Pearl Street Mall. So, consider in your own experience, with your own constituents, the possibility of making College and 13th Street car-free, or part of the Alpine Balsam Complex car-free, or part of 29th Street car-free. Just. And, and there are others that I'm sure you, you can think of, but that would put Boulder on the map as a pedestrian-friendly city beyond anything else we could do. And thirdly, I'd like to have you consider reinstating the International Pedestrian Conference. For many years, we brought authorities from all over the country and all over the world to give us ideas beyond what we've been thinking to move us to the future to a better pedestrian community. Again, I thank you for your service and thank you for letting me be part of the pack. It was a great joy. Thank you, Spence. Spence. We appreciate you. Um, Kelly Simmons. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you and bring your attention to an issue that's very near and dear to me. First, I wanna say that I'm um, in support of Vision Zero and um, walkable, bikeable neighborhoods and safe, greater safety in our neighborhoods. So I wanna let you know that I really support um, the recommendations, but I also wanna call your attention to the area of Boulder where I've lived for the last 17 years that is extremely unsafe, and that is the section of South Broadway between Table Mesa and 27th Way. And um, what we have there is a disproportionate impact from four different regional bus lines to um, local bus lines. We have tractor trailer rigs. We have six lanes of traffic traveling at over 50 miles an hour, running red lights. We have an enormous amount of pedestrian traffic. There's a major north-south bicycle 
pedestrian arterial. There is access to open space up through the Skunk Creek Corridor. There's a school that um, folks from Dartmouth are trying to get to. There's two preschools. There's a church on the corner. It's an incredibly busy um, intersection on the east side of B Broadway. We don't have a, ped a pedestrian bike friendly sidewalk. We have a house that's turning a driveway that's turning directly on to South Broadway with three lanes of traffic, um, regional buses, uh, uh, tractor trailer rigs, dump trucks, all traveling at high speeds. And much of this traffic is running the red light at Dartmouth. Now I've met with your wonderful staff, Kathleen and Bill, out at this section. They agreed that it's a very unsafe intersection. We discussed a number of things that could be done about it. They had agreed to go and check into those things. I know they've been very busy with the transportation master plan, but I've not heard from them about seeing if we could get a school zone, if we could get um, photo enforcement, if we can't get photo enforcement, if we could get um, just one of those lights that says how fast you're speeding. Um, there's lots of things that we could do um, about this intersection, but there's accidents between bicycles and cars, there's ac or crashes, there's crashes between cars and cars. It's a very, very high speed, very dangerous, unsafe, uncomfortable. I use it every day, and I have for the last 10 years, and I have witnessed incidents as long as my arm um, with multiple cars um, speeding through that intersection at over 50 miles an hour when there are six people trying to cross Broadway to get from one side to the other who are getting off their buses. It's just, I invite you all to come out at rush hour and stand there with me as Kathleen and Bill have done and witness what is going on there every day because it's serious. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Mark. Hi, Mark McIntyre, 1475 Moss Rock Place. Uh, I am a Transportation Advisory Board member, but I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight. First, I just wanna say, um, I feel like it's been a real privilege to work with this Transportation Advisory Board and this staff uh, to complete this plan. It's been an incredible education process for me, but we've just worked together really well as a board. We've worked together with staff, which doesn't mean that there's not tension, there's not uh, uh, disagreement, but it's been really productive, and I think the plan reflects that. The only thing I wanna say tonight is the plan has a 2030 planning horizon, and that was a decision that we made, the staff brought to us, and, and TAB reinforced that yes, there is urgency here. So, to achieve the goals that are in the plan, with a 2030 planning horizon will require change. And that change will require political will. And I ask you, as decision points come before you, that you give staff your support and uh, agreement that real change will need to be made and that um, they need to have, uh, know that you have their back to make these real changes to implement the plan. Thank you. Mark, mm -hmm. um, give us some examples of what you're talking about. Uh, serious consideration of 20 miles per hour, first on 13th Street, next everywhere else in residential streets. Um, uh, raised, elevated, protected uh, bike lanes, and, and implementation of the low stress bike and walk network. We have a lot of green on the map but actually making those streets, doing the engineering treatments um, uh, is going to require some real change for people and, and change in neighborhoods. And, and some may be uncomfortable for people that um, uh, it, it might create a, uh, a car delay for them. So uh, it, it, it might involve four to three lane conversions, but to reach our goals to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips, to increase alternate modes, um, it's gonna require uh, changes to whether it's maintenance, how we allocate maintenance dollars, because we have, you know, we have a limited budget, so, oops. So shifting that around um, could really take some, take some will, and it's time for us to be bold again. I, you know, we're still living the fulsome uh, legacy, 
And so it's time for us to go ahead and attempt and try and do some new things. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue Pratt, and then Lisa White. Hello, uh, hello, Superintendent Executive Director, Community Cycles. I'd like to thank staff, TAB, and Council for a great job on TMP and your leadership and commitment to Vision Zero. Community Cycles is asking Council to adopt this TMP and move forward with the public process around lowering residential speed limits to 20 miles per hour. We understand lowering speeds to 20 miles per hour is not a cure-all. But lowering speed limits should be considered a foundational piece of the Vision Zero effort. We need to start somewhere. 20 miles per hour will serve as a building block as the city implements neighborhood traffic mitigation projects, neighborhood green streets, and other supportive strategies. The move towards lower speed limits is relatively recent, but we are seeing a reduction of two to three miles per hour, the difference between life and death. Portland, Oregon embraced 20 miles per hour in 2017. Matt Kelly of the Portland Bureau of Transportation told us, I would argue that the 20 mile per hour reduction has provided benefits that are not necessarily visible on the street. It's generated media attention and public interest that has helped us publicize the impact of speed on safety and to promote our Vision Zero goals. It's aided speed limit reductions on larger streets by providing a lower baseline to which compare them to. It supports our work internally with our planners and engineers to discuss the importance of identifying design speeds in all of our projects and making sure we build towards those speeds. The traditional practice of setting speed limits based on how fast people drive, called the 85th percentile, which is used in Boulder, has been discredited. Jim Charlier in, in a study writes, the, conce the concept that speed limits should be uh, set should be set using observed speeds of vehicles in free flow traffic conditions is based on data from vehicle to vehicle con collisions in rural places collected in the 1950s. There's no modern research basis for use of this concept in setting speed limits on city streets where pedestrians and bicyclists are likely to be encountered. While the 85th percentile is still national guidance, the FHWA is expected to update that guidance in early 2020. Breaking the deadly cycle of traffic violence requires bold move by leaders. <coughs> Boulder has an opportunity to lead in this space, building on the strong loans of infrastructure already in place in our community. Our efforts will contribute to the growing momentum of safer streets for all. We thank you for your leadership and stand ready to assist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Oh, oh, we have questions. S Sue, what do you think of Spence's idea of uh, 15 miles an hour in, in school areas? Um, I don't know research on that, so I can't speak to that. Um, but slower is always safer. Well, he and I have brought up in former, and actually Bob, the speed, speed issue, Bob brought up at the first transportation um, meeting that we had since I've been on this council. Um, but it's, it is, it's something that I think needs to be addressed in this 15 miles an hour in both Crested Butte and Buena Vista works. Mm -hmm. There is enforcement to back it up. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the 15. Slower is safer. 20 is plenty, slower is safer. <laughs> so, uh, Sue, thanks for coming tonight. And just, uh, you know, so we've got a lot of changes uh, and improvements to the bicycle low stress network and things like that. In your role as the director of community cycles, do you feel like this is on the right track or do you feel good about this plan? I, I do feel like this is a great TMP and it's really very much on the right track. Staff did an excellent job. TAB was very involved. It's the really the most engaged TAB I've worked with. Um, and, and I feel like we're moving ahead. Um, whenever you move ahead, you do have to say, take some little bold jumps. And I feel like this is a little bold jump we need to take quickly to get ahead and start to work on some of our bigger goals, but this is going to set the groundwork for the Green Streets program and the neighborhood, um, the low stress network and the neighborhood speed mitigation, so that we're not fighting the battle over every single street, which is, you know, what happens when you have bike networks and stuff like that. It's much better to do these things holistically, and then we can move ahead with, you know, putting our energies on the real problem areas and those mitigations that need it. Plus, this is more equitable. You know, neighborhood speed management program, that requires the neighborhood to organize and present a petition and everything like that. Well, not every neighborhood is capable of that, but every neighborhood should have slow streets for their, their residents. So this equitably applies it throughout the city. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Lisa. 
And then we'll have Lynn Siegel. Hello, um, Lisa White. Uh, I live in Boulder and I have been a member of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, the PAC. Um, so I'm really grateful to have been a part of this process and I've been really impressed with staff and they've done an amazing job on engagement throughout the entire TMP and on the plan itself. And special thank you to Amy for all of her work on the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, she is awesome. And I'm really excited about the direction the city is headed um, for the transportation master plan. It lays out a goal of reducing our environmental impact, improving our air quality, and creating more sustainable transportation options in walkable neighborhoods. This is a win for everyone. If we make it easier and safer for people who want to be able to take transit, bike, and walk, then we improve the environment, air quality, and safety for, for all, even safety for when we need to drive. And uh, in the TMP, I'm also really happy to see that there's a focus on equity and vulnerable populations. The community-wide equity index and also pursuing free transit would be huge. And as we consider equity, I'd love for us to go further in considering the cost of slow progress as it perpetuates existing inequities. Uh, for example, car ownership is a financial burden and it impacts those of lower financial means the most. Our current system requires a car for many people to get where they need to go. And those who can't drive a car due to cost or not having a license, their age, physical impairments, they have to use the existing system with lots of gaps in safety and convenience. And uh, moreover, those of lower income tend to be most impacted by uh, air pollution as they're on streets with more cars. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to quantify the cost of inaction or slow progress against creating um, affordable mo mobility options. Um, and lastly, uh, I have concerns about the political and funding barriers that we've encountered in the past and will likely continue to experience in the future. And that's where you as council come in. So I hope that those of you who um, are gonna continue on council as the plan gets implemented and with the approval tonight will help push through those political and funding barriers so that we can make, make progress and take bold action to move faster towards our goals. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn here. Okay, David Adamson. And then Jim Morris. So there's some for staff and for council, but you have to share with their staff. <laughs> I'm David Adamson. 815 North Street, uh, Executive Director of Goose Creek Community Land Trust. And I've been uh, biking around this town since before the first TMP when I lived next to Cindy. And it's always been a great joy. And those are the two, I mean, it was a great joy living next to Cindy. And it's a great joy biking around this town. <laughs> I've uh, been nearly hit twice, but I'm still here biking. And, uh, and now I don't fly anymore. And I only take electric cars. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up now is because I'm going to emphasize two things tonight. Let's be really bold. Bo this is a great start with the TMP, but we have 10 years, as the climate scientists say, we need to be very bold in transforming our transportation. Just like we are doing at Alpine Balsam, where we're creating a welcoming and inclusive new model, new, new model for equitable, affordable, and sustainable living. We need to do the same thing for transport, and we're starting to do that at Alpine Balsam. I met with Joe Castro today. We're gonna to take 10 spots over at the parking structure there, and I'm gonna take my tenants, and they have to park their cars over there so that they think a little bit before they go, oh, I'm gonna drive my car. No, I'll take the bike, I'll take the EcoPass that we got from our landlord, et cetera. So I want to emphasize um, in being bold, two key things. One, number one, is let's do things Things that lead with the benefits. And I want to mention something called a one earth or a one earth. And I want to thank the staff who's helped me with this. They've helped um, listen to it. Kathleen and Randall and Amy have all helped listen to this idea, which is a beautiful part. You see, you, you have your handouts? Okay. Yep. 
So there's a physical side to a Wooner, which is this uh, idea of how uh, cars are a guest, and there is the connecting, the people connecting with each other side to the Wooner. And this is very, very important, that people in cars on our linear streets get disconnected. A Wooner is a way to help bring people together. It creates many, many ways for people to be reconnected, and this is a very important part of it. But the main idea that I want to emphasize about the Wooner is the idea that this is an intensi intensification of transportation delight. <laughs> so we are creating really beautiful, just like I've done, I've done with Cindy, biking around this town as Sam, and you all know, you're all great bikers, thank you. It is fun, it is beautiful, let's do that more, let's make it so good that kids and, and uh, uh, parents want to go out there on these separate, they're separate, Vision Zero, it's impossible. Cars are hard and people are squishy. We should separate them. <laughs> um, and I want to say it's been widely done in Europe. There are two million people living on 6,000 uh, Wooners. So I'd like to ask staff to work together with us to look more at Wooners on North Street, which Brian Bowen already put. And then I want you to be bold about funding. Let's, f let's tax the things we don't want. All these luxury cars, let's get the money from the things that we don't want. Parking, you know, gas cars parking and luxury cars. Thank Thank you very much. Hang on. Hang on. Can I? Oh, well, we have questions. So first of all, I think we have a new slogan for the Vision Zero program, which is that cars are hard and people are squishy. And beautifully <laughs> that was, squishy. That was, we, we, right? Yeah. That was good. That was good. Okay. No, actually, this is a I'll question. go with it. Yeah. This is a question for staff, just while you're here, David, on this. So like, I, David's talked to uh, us about this Unerf idea on North Street uh, before. What would be the mechanism for the city to consider a project uh, like that? Because it's very intriguing. Bill Cowan, Transportation Division. Um, there isn't a mechanism specifically for Warners. Um, I think that it, where it would most logically um, have synergy is with our neighborhood speed management program um, and would be a very complex project inside of that program. Um, it would have a lot of the uh, same kinds of benefits and same kinds of impacts that a complex neighborhood speed management project would have. Can I add so, one so thing about that? Was, so it would be something where maybe somebody could make an application under that, but obviously there are funding implications, design, whatever. Correct. But I, I just think about, um, like, I don't know how long ago this was, but certain small connector streets were closed and turned into little pocket parks decades ago, right? I yes. don't know when that was done. Like, how, how was that sort of thing done back in the day? Um, well, it was, it was done. Uh, well, let's just, I'll say it was done before my time, so what I'm telling you is anecdotal. But Wendell, you, you may be our most, so what do you think? Yeah. No, but my understanding is that it was done. Um, it was done through some level of process. There were impacts in terms of traffic diversion and so forth that resulted in the city um, creating some policy that says if you're going to do this again, you need to go through this very robust process and get city council to approve it. Um, so it... it clearly can be done, and, mm -hmm. um, if done, should be done through a very robust process like we engage in okay. in any impactful project. S Cindy has so a perspective. I've been involved in a couple of them, and they, at that time it, there were CBD, CBDG grants, grants, that's redundant, community development block grants that funded the one at Fifth and Spruce, and the community benefit was that the grade of the street, school children having to walk in the middle of it, that kind of thing. The process with the city wasn't um, as onerous as it can be today in many things, um, but the one at Fifth Street did the same thing. And there are two now two very nice pocket parks that are enjoyed not only by the people in the neighborhood, but they serve safety issues as well as um, aesthetic and park issues too. And by the larger community is what I mean to say. Just what Bill said, can saying. I address funding one? Yeah, maybe just real quick, David. Yeah. Yeah. So what's cool yeah, about the question. North Street Wooner, and if you look at that thing, and I've been working on this with staff, I've been working on this with staff, is that there's a, you know, important money for drainage. Like that's a very steep. So the Wooner is a great uh, opportunity to um, 
uh, bring in drainage improvements. There's no stormwater capture all along this big hill there. And so in that design, which we've done with a landscape architect, there is drainage money, you know, resilience money, and we can incorporate some transportation improvements along the way. Plus I have neighborhood support from some landowners to do it and a general improvement district could be another way to help show, again, the point is do something that people perceive as this is really in my interest. You're not taking away my car. Right. You're doing something that's beautiful that I love that adds value to my property. <coughs> so I think the North Street is a great spot to help show how we can do something that people who might resist change otherwise say, oh, this is in my interest. Way to go, city. D D David, I just want one more thing about the using the the plan to slow down water because it goes into Goose Creek, right? It's part that's of that right. floodway. It's it right down into 9th Street and starts. And that's where we're, Goose Creek Community Land Trust is looking at the whole thing, you know, and, and Brian Bowen in the planning board put uh, the North Street Woonerf on part of the connections plan. And so I'm just, they, you, they said, if you want to do this, get it into the TMP. So I'm trying to get it into the TMP. <laughs> but I think it has we brought appreciate your impact efforts. across the city to connect these 15 minute neighborhoods with these separate bikeways that people really like and go, wow, this is a better way to travel. We see that with all these electric cargo bikes and all the families going that David, way. Thank you. U utilities. I'm a little excited about the <laughs> just, a, just a little. It's unusual, but it's right. true. <laughs> it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, utilities could help pay for that too, David. Right? There you go. So, Lynn, you were gone. Do you want to speak now? Yeah. Okay. Lynn Siegel, um, Mountain Heights. Um, I, I left my notes up at the pollinator talk. <laughs> I hope I can get them in the morning. I have to get up very early to find them. Um, but um, at the last t t tab meeting I was at, um, Wrigler, what's your first name? It's Bill. <laughs> Come on. Bill. Bill, okay, Bill mentioned um, this this statement, he said, um, when you're looking at council candidates coming up, don't think about the 60,000 in commuters, think about mobility. Well, here's my issue with mobility, okay? And that is, if you had to walk to Denver to go to work every day, it would take you probably seven hours to walk to work. Even using a bicycle, definitely using a bus or a car, even if it's an EV, cause there's embodied energy to create the, that structure that has to move you from point A to point B. Ultimately, you don't want to go to point A to point B. If you work at the NSGS or you work at something that has to be in a distant place, then there should be exceptions. But otherwise, we get cross-commuting and we, we have so many demands to our city as a result of of these transportation issues and of streets. I was listening to the tab um, as far as the potholes and everything and what they really need to do is put new asphalt, but that's expensive. Well, things are expensive. You know, infrastructure is falling apart for the mobile homes. It's falling apart for everything. Um, so I get that, but transportation, <laughs> Um, has got to be better paid for by the developer. I mean, that's what I whine about all the time, but I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you the <laughs> big <laughs> fat guy has to pay because otherwise we all are. And then there's more affordable housing issues, right? And then we're fighting, up, we're chasing our tail all the time. So please put that into your pipe and smoke it as far as the the transportation master plan um, principles and the foundations of it. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Awesome. Jim Morris. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Morris. I live at 60 South 33rd Street. I'm at first going to speak for Margaret Smith who could not attend tonight. She used to be the state bike champ and is an architect. She was hit by a car while riding her bike on the bicycle path along Broadway and Darley a couple of weeks ago. She's mostly okay and everything, so it's not a big deal, but her primary concern are the intersections with the Broadway bike path at Ludlow, Darley, Hanover, and Table Mesa Shopping Center. Vehicle traffic at these intersections must be slowed and in such a fashion to alert drivers of the right of way of bicycles. 
Her second concern is the westbound entrance for the tunnel. There's a tunnel between the east and west sides of Broadway from Lashley Lane to the Bear Creek bike path between Brookfield and Whitney. It's narrow, awkward, dangerous, and from her comments, it sounds like it has, it's built to be intentionally narrow in some places and to have some raised edges and curves that you hit your bike pedals on. It sounds, she actually tries to go in and out of it in the opposite direction anyway in order to avoid being hit. So she's fairly knowledgeable of being an architect and having been the bike champion for the state. So it might be worth listening to her written comments that she sent to you. Now I wanna speak and please don't hold anything I say against Margaret. <laughs> but, and I recognize several of you from being on the bike pass. And I just wanted to say, um, I really like, in general, I love the bike paths. I like that you fix cracks and potholes. I've, it's not quite 50 years I've been biking to either university or to jobs, I guess 46 years. So I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I really do not like the yellow flashing lights. I have a friend for the mid-block crossings who's still sort of maimed, still going through trying to re regain her, main, her use of her brain. She was a bicyclist and was hit in the crossing. Um, I don't like the merge yield right turn things, University and Broadway, Baseline and Foothills, Foothills and Baseline. All sorts of places where they're pedestrians or sometimes I'm on, a, I'm on a bike and you're going very slowly in a you know walk or bike, multi-mold, whatever you call it. And there's cars that are you know, they're going 25 or 30 making a right hand turn. They're maybe northbound on Broadway and they're trying to turn right on University or they're southbound on Foothills and they're turning right on, anyway, there's, I also don't like creeping cars. I've had friends and myself, I've almost been hit several times by people who creep out to cross a pedestrian or multimodal thing. You can be in the crosswalk and people, 29th Street Mall, um, north towards Linden, all sorts of places where either as a pedestrian or multimodal, people sort of quickly go out, they look over their left shoulder because they're wanting to make a left turn or something or a right turn and they, they got it and they don't see you. So <coughs> thanks a lot for trying to make this place better and I really, uh, one for instance, take deep breaths and say to yourself, those other speeding drivers are more important than you and it helps you. Thank you, Jim. Evan. Evan Rabbits, North Broadway. So as the guy who got together an online petition for to allow e-bikes on the PATH system and got it through council in 2013, I searched the master plan for e-bikes and electric bikes. And electric bikes appear twice, lumped in with electric scooters and in one place as part of shared mobility. We don't have any shared e-bikes in this town. We have thousands of personal e-bikes. And so it, it's not worth just two words in the master plan. So <clears throat> you need some data. So today um, I went to uh, Balsam and 13th and counted from eight to 10 in the morning and four to six in the afternoon, all the bikes and e-bikes. And basically it's 14% of bikes are e-bikes. And uh, that's probably an undercount because if they're hub motors and they have enclosed batteries, they can pass for regular bikes. So I'm gonna say 15%. And that's up from just a few percent four or five years ago, and it's going to triple again, and it's gonna take people off the bus because I can get anywhere in town, all the way from North Broadway to South Broadway in 15, 20 minutes. If you have to take two buses in Boulder, you're in for a 45 minute journey, what you can probably do in 10 or 15, minutes on an e-bike. And this is good because those big oversized buses that Steve Pomerantz, when we defeated the transit tax in 1994 called the Big Bus Empire, have destroyed our roads. Every time you cross 28th Street especially, Walnut right in front of the bus station where there are no big trucks, 
the road is terribly rutted because of something else that doesn't appear in the master plan, and that's the fourth power rule that Sam has cited in a different context, which basically says that our buses, which weigh roughly 10 times what a car weighs, don't do 10 times the damage, they do 10 thousand times the damage. And that was fine as long as Boulder had the money to <clears throat> violate the laws of physics. As soon as the flood came, we didn't have the money to keep repaving and annoying people. And now the roads are in terrible shape because we could never get RTD to use 15 passenger vehicles, which are the right size for many of the Boulder routes. Thanks. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Michael Tompkins. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm Mike Tompkins. I'm from Drexel Street down in Table Mesa. And so I'd like to thank the TAB staff and the, the pedestrian committee, everybody, because I got to see firsthand why you do what you do. Uh, my daughter bounced off a car last week or two weeks ago now. 15 miles an hour sounds slow. It was not a high-speed collision. It was a very low-speed collision. It was at a crosswalk, and it was just a driver error. And I'll tell you, 15 miles an hour, she was good. She was on a 26-inch bike, so she went over the hood, because if she went under the car, it would have been a totally different outcome. Up, and that was like a two-week-ago beginning of school change, where I got her sister to move up a bike, and she took her sister's bike. The other thing is, of course, helmets help, because she bounced off the windshield in the air, then, because the car's stopping, right? She's now moving. And what you have to remember about physics is energy is what I liked what the gentleman earlier said about you know the human crumple zone. This 20 mile an hour speed limit thing is a great idea. There are people that are gonna go faster anyway, but 20 to 25 could be life and death for a lot of these kids. 15, she did not have head, neck, or back injuries. I think partly because she's a good athlete. I mean, she, we, it, the mother mothers that saw this, there were two kids that didn't go to school that day because they thought she was in really bad shape, and we all did. Ambulance ride, you know, the, the, the whole nine yards. She checked out okay, no head, neck, or back, but five miles an hour faster in the car, that's 50% more energy uh, between 20 and 25, even, even a bigger percentage if you go from 15 to 20. So keep, keep that in mind. I think that this, this idea of being bold, I understand there's, there's uh, some hesitancy because of the, the public part of this and, and, oh, you're gonna make us go slower. Hey, these are fairly short streets <laughs> in the neighborhoods and I realize you have to socialize it. You have to build buy-in. But if you can share data about what it means to children, what it means to drive a little slower for six blocks until you get to the artery, I think, I think you, can build, you can build that story and build that advocacy. And so I, I, I would strongly advocate considering the 20 mile an hour speed limit as something that moves forward. In the, in the language in the, in the TMP, there was some argument at the TAB meeting about, it was just saying explore, and, and perhaps it should be stronger language. I completely agree that understanding, it's the same thing with people driving downhill fast in snow, right? It's physics, it's energy, it's not speed, right? And so it's the same thing here in the crumple zone in the human body, it takes a beating. I watched my daughter flip through the air, land really hard, and uh, like I said, I think when you have that data in front of you, 20 mile an hour thing is a, a really easy thing to sell. Great. Thank you so much. I, <laughs> we're so glad that um, there wasn't more damage. And I appreciate you coming out tonight to share your story. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I appreciate, like I said, the, the, the work poured into this, the, the, the staff and the <clears throat> people that volunteered their time to make this happen. It really is important because these decisions, a few small changes at a few small intersections, could save lives. And, and we're, what we're doing, Tila hooked me up with folks that, at Whittier that started a crossing guard program, which everyone in our neighborhood is saying, why don't we have a crossing guard program? So I, we're, we have tons of volunteer support for that. We're meeting actually tomorrow morning Great. to learn about how they did that at Whittier, and hopefully we're gonna do it in our neighborhood. And again, it's not only crossing guards. There are a lot of vehicle human interactions that can happen. We see, you know, kids do erratic stuff, and cars moving a little slower on those, those neighborhood streets will really help. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tompkins. Um, so I guess that's it for the public hearing. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'll note that Andrea from the chamber left me a message saying, please emphasize how excited the, and he says you can speak on behalf of the business communities 
about this plan and the work that the staff did and Tab did, and um, I know he sent us a letter. Um, so he wanted me to underscore since he couldn't be here, and we don't always get um, agreement from them, so it's nice to hear. Um, with that, um, let's turn back to council. I know we didn't have a chance to ask questions, um, so why don't we do some quick questions, and then we'll jump into um, the lib yeah, gushing. <laughs> okay, Aaron. Yeah, I don't have that many questions, <clears throat> but a couple. This one question I had for you, so we, we talk about um, the future of the EcoPass program and the fair free zone in the city. You just tell us, uh, my understanding was that the last time that there were conversations with RTD about a community-wide EcoPass, that they were not necessarily open to that recently. Can you give us a quick update on what the status of those discussions and negotiations are, please? Sure, uh, Chris Hagelin. Um, so yes, uh, the city and the county, uh, I believe it was in 2014, teamed up to do a countywide uh, feasibility study for <coughs> community-wide EcoPass. Uh, so we looked at both uh, city, uh, a city cost and then a full county cost uh, to provide EcoPasses to all residents and employees. Uh, we produced that report. We had a methodology for the pricing. Uh, we even include additional funding for induced demand for once everybody does have a pass to, in, uh, to have more buses, more routes. Um, we really did not receive much uh, back from RTD on that plan. Um, and I think what the recent pass program working group um, results showed is that the RTD is still in a similar position on the EcoPass. Uh, the first options that they brought out at that PASS program working group did not include an EcoPass of any kind. Uh, we fought very hard, and I'd like to thank Mary Young for her work on that, uh, to, to bring the EcoPass back uh, through that PASS program working group. Uh, but I think that some of the impacts of the decisions that were made uh, by the RTD staff and board um, are gonna continue to have uh, significant impacts on the EcoPass program. I think the neighborhoods are gonna experience significant cost increases. I think uh, same with our businesses, especially our districts. So um, I would say that we have very little traction with RTD on this community-wide EcoPass, but I think you know the silver lining is our renewed vision for transit, uh, which says, can we replicate the hop model over and over again until we and essentially and Chris, I'm going to interrupt you because I yeah. just wanted oh. that answer okay. on the EcoPass so that yeah. basically they're not really willing to work with us to implement that. I, I would say that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, can we? Go, but don't go. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's wrestle this one to the ground. No, but uh, I, I will add just uh, some good news that did come out yeah. of, of that whole um, past working group, which was um, two big things on the equity front, which is the 75% youth discount, Seven. which is huge. Yeah. Um, 75%, yeah? Was 70. it 70? 70. 70, okay, 70% discount for youth. And then um, the 180% um, FPL, federal poverty level, um, discount low income bus yeah, fare, which is 60, oh, it's- Well, it's, it's a 40% discount. They're right, it's 40%, they'd be 60%. Yes. So um, not, entirely um, affordable for someone, that's still $4 a day, but it, um, it, did re it, it did create some equity from that standpoint. The EcoPass will still be available, but as Chris said, it will be um, um, usage-based. Well, so, okay, so you want to talk, I want to talk, and then Sam. I, but how much does the city pay into RTD annually? Taxes, does anybody know? The now there's of the two different cents. kinds. Yes. The point, the point six, I'm, you may yeah. know that. So, um, uh, so if you're asking for what does the community pay into RTD, the last assessment that we did um, was through our renewed vision for transit. At that point in time, it was approximately $22 million a year for the base service and $9 million toward fast tracks. And that's where we did that return on investment um, analysis. and. It, um, at that point in time, it was looking like there was more of a one-to-one -one ratio for the local transit service. But for example, on fast tracks, the community is contributing $9 million a year and getting approximately $2 million a year back in regional service, meaning the Flatiron Flyer. So 
So those are just the latest numbers that I, I have. Thank you. So I guess my question is, and, and this is probably a legal question, is do cities who are of necessity in RTD, um, who are having paying more, having their services cut, having less and less transit services, is there any legal um, way to deal with this? Has anyone ever challenged this? It seems like the most inequitable kind of arrangement for a public, something that's supposed to be a public um, amenity that, that I've come into contact with. I mean, it's just, it's criminal. Not to my knowledge, but I mean, we could certainly look into that and, and let you know. Um, I'm, <coughs> I just can't imagine off the top of my head what kind of mechanism that would be. I mean, it, it, here we are talking about replacing the, the, the routes that they have let go, you know, and building our own bus service on top of what we pay to them. We pay them this much annually. It's so crazy. Did, didn't we do an analysis yes, of what so it would take to leave RT or whether it was feasible? Yeah. Right, so that's the renewed vision for transit study that I was referring to that we worked on uh, over the last several years. We worked on it again with the city, with the county, uh, with the university, and looked at a variety of options on, on how we could look at um, delivering transit differently, both on the local level and the regional level. And from the recommendations that came out of that study, it was looking to grow the HOP model is what we, mm -hmm. we use the shorthand we use for that. But it's basically where um, the city would operate the service similar to how we contract the HOP service with VIA today. But the HOP is co-funded by RTD. They're, they're paying us to help subsidize those trips along with the CU students and then the city. So the idea was taking that model and helping to co-fund other local routes so that we can have more um, say in the, the routing, the frequency, the directness, all of those criteria. So that's part of the renewed vision for transit recommendations that's embedded in the transportation master plan is moving forward with those types of strategies. It doesn't alleviate RTD's commitment to uh, pay for transit in the community. It's just paying for it differently than how they're doing it today. The other most recent example is CU has taken over operation of the Stampede. In the mm -hmm. past, RTD operated the Stampede and CU paid them to do it. This year when school started, they flipped that arrangement over and the university is running it. So there are, to your point, there are options and recommendations in that study that, that we think are important to continue to work on both locally and regionally to find different ways to deliver service and get more return on our investment for transit. So you're looking at a big, and so you're, you've actually worked this out to some extent to see what kind of a return you will be getting. Right, and that's the idea, is that um, each of the different scenarios we looked at, there were different levels of, of return. <clears throat> we looked at national best practices. There's many cities around the country that operate um, local types of transit system inside of a larger regional provider. So the city of Santa Monica operates within the LA metro area, for example. Um, there's a variety, a handful of examples that we looked at, and there's different models on how, how we could do that. So how do we look at what we can do best and operate locally, what can RTD do best, and how do they grow the service. Um, the opportunity that's in front of us right now is that um, RTD has started their um, transportation transformation or reimagine RTD, kind of a strategic planning process for, the, for themselves, for the whole metro area. So <coughs> pushing together their strategic planning and our strategic planning I think is a crucial opportunity in the next year to look at how do we do this together and find different ways rather than staying stuck where we are. Because we cannot yeah. stay where we are in this arrangement. It is not sustainable, it's not workable, and we're not delivering quality service. And, and, people, and the number, and the, one of the reasons I bring this up is because I've heard from so many people so repetitively about how things are cut, they're paying more, and we're trying to do these things to make, particularly with the greenhouse gases, and it's just not easy. Right. For people to do that. So you're right. None of it is easy. It's just very no. important to do and to do better than we are. So that would be another thing I would just suggest communicating more widely to the public. Sure. Um, and as part of this reimagine RTD, I do think that this is something that we're, we're uh, given a little gift package to the next council of things we hope that they will continue to work on. And I suggest that we put this piece of it um, near the top. 
And I'll just say that I, I do think trying to come to some agreement with RTD where they don't stand in the way of our ambitions um, and we work out this agreement where we get to handle more of our local um, transit while being held harmless <laughs> for the extra effort we want to put into it, um, I think is going to be a, is really key. And if they want to reimagine RTD, we should help them do it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have Sam on this, and then I don't know if we're going back to you. I had a couple more. You had a couple more, then we're going back to Aaron. I was just colloquing on the uh, EcoPass question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so it says in here, in the DMP, that we procured or provided 82,000 EcoPasses to residents. And I was just curious what the breakdown of that 82,000, that was more than I expected, so. Well, that includes CU students. Yep. Uh, so we have CU students around 30,000. Uh, through the neighborhood program, it's around 12,000. Uh, you've got about um, 30 plus thousand in the voluntary business program, and then the rest are found in our districts in Ugid, Cajid, and Boulder Junction. Um, so I can get you the exact breakdown. We, no, have, we have them in the report. Actually, they're in the report on progress mm -hmm. okay. uh, from last year. Great, and, thank and you. And CU faculty and staff, yeah. about 8,000. Yeah, yeah, because there's 9,000, about 9,000 faculty at CU mm -hmm. as well. Great. Aaron? Okay, just one more question. I have some comments for later, but um, so just uh, uh, on uh, pavement condition, just to, like to Mary's points about uh, how we all know it's cheaper if you deal with it earlier. I, I forget was that is that called out in the master plan? Um, that that Are principle. Um, could could you clarify so, the question? So I mean, the so the, the principle the the principle that early investment in taking care <clears throat> of our uh, roads and paths. It, you, it is the more cost-effective way to do things and, and the focus that we try to have, something like to that effect. I'm not sure we've said it in quite that way, but we've certainly recognized the importance of operations and maintenance and investing soon is gonna be cheaper than investing later. Well, I think that's a little bit different. Yeah, let me yeah. Uh, let me just clarify. The, the TMP um, calls out our investment um, priorities, and so um, asset management taking care of the system um, is one of the, is the top priority that's in there. So there's a longer description of that, but that's the um, really comes the, down to comes down to taking care of the system okay. that we have, and it's part of it. And we can certainly expand upon that to make it more clear that that's investing early rather than really. But there's a lot of things that are packed into that state the policy statement about the investment priority. And so just so can I look that up? Do you know roughly where that is in the <laughs> document? I, I can look for it real, real okay, quick here. I'll let somebody else go. Mary. So I had a question about, um, let me get back to my page where I had that question. Okay. It's page 264 of our packet um, where um, the the memo is actually talking about the the prioritization process, and you're talking about the the factors that were put into the prioritization process, um, which is you know population density, employment density, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I had a question, um, and you started to respond to it, um, Randall, earlier, but um, how those nine factors were applied to come up with where you would put the focus on both the pedestrian plan and the low stress network. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we actually, in terms of the prioritization model, we use six factors, and then there are mm -hmm. three factors that are flags, and so 100 year floodplain, for example, is one of those flags, historic, mm -hmm. and uh, neighborhood access. And so that just gives us information on potential <coughs> complexity of projects, but then the six factors that are used, one of those is the <coughs> equity index, mm -hmm. and there are five or six factors that go into that individually, and then things like population density, employment density, affordable housing, uh, transit ridership, representative stops, et cetera, are the other five factors mm -hmm. that, are, that are included. Right now, they're weighted equally, 
And we, as a staff, reviewed that in terms of the output, but we really see that process as being more of a tool than a result. So we recognize, as I think I said, we've got a CIP project process and a budget process, mm -hmm. and we can continue to use this tool based on guidance to look at different mixes of projects as we weight those factors differently. So the tool, um, so those factors that you that you listed on that um, page in the memo, they aren't looking at how, say, for example, um, how uh, how income, for example, um, intersects with um, with. I thought I saw yeah the equity, which is the the age. So where where that intersects with, I don't see um, poverty on here at all. So low income is one of the equity factors, as is car-free households, uh, disability, age over 65, less than. So I guess my, my question is, is if you, if you take a look at, were you taking a look at all at how different factors intersect with each other um, so that it, it's the intersections of some of these factors that create greater need, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you were looking at these factors in that way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's when you, I mean, basically the factors are added together and so they build on each other. And, and I think the, the answer is yes to the question you're asking. Okay, thank you. Um, that was my question. Oh, and I guess, um, yeah, that was my question. Thank you. Sam. So <clears throat> I had a few questions and I just wanted to kind of level set. One of the things we were able to find in the safety piece of this was great crash maps and the number of violations that were um, photo related. So we had the photo red light and we had the photo speeding. But what I didn't see in there were any number of citations or violations for speeding issued by live policemen and women. So I was, was that in there somewhere and I just missed it because I was looking in the speeding section and... You're referencing the Safe Streets report? Yes, and I think it's on page 414 of the packet. Let me go there and look. I, I do not believe that there were any statistics in there from live officer uh, uh, violations issued. So I think that would be interesting to have in the report yeah. because you've got live officers here and you saw what the composition of how many people are in that yeah. traffic division. And then right next to it, you have the, the photo statistics and those were shockingly high. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. like 30,000 citations, almost 25 or 27,000 citations from photo yeah. enforcement. <clears throat> and. And if you look at the fact that speeding is going up, mm -hmm. right, the last four years, the, the speeding crashes, crashes which involved speeding, have gone up by like 50 crashes a year. Um, so in, anyway, I would just suggest that mm -hmm. if it's not in there that you add that to the final report. Um, I think that'll be easy enough for you to get. Um, okay. And then I just wanted to clarify on page 400, it says, over three years, 2015 to 17, 21,000 people were involved in crashes. So that's the actual number of people who were involved, right? Because the crash number is like 3,000 a that's year. That's correct. Okay, got it. And I just wanted to check on page 403, there is a citation that these crashes, taken as a whole, have $100 million a year in societal costs. And I was curious if you could speak to how you derive that figure. Um, there are uh, cost factors that um, are provided by the Colorado Department of Transportation for, um, for property damage, um, for levels of injury, and for fatalities. Um, and, they're, and they jump up significantly. I don't recall what the dollars amounts are off the top of my head, um, but uh, property damage crashes averages out to be a relatively small amount of societal cost, a person being injured much greater, a person being killed, um, you know, well over a million dollars. Okay. I, I just think that's a useful number for us to keep in our heads as we're talking about budgets is that, you know, the safety, we were talking about budgets of 
hundreds of thousands of dollars for Vision Zero, yeah. but people being involved in crashes are accruing costs to them and maybe somewhat to the city yeah. of a hundred million dollars a year in societal costs. And so I just want to keep those numbers firmly in front of us because there's, of course, the pain and suffering piece of it too, but there's also you know, the fact that it's costing those people a lot of money or their insurance carrier or our police to handle this. So um, let me see if there's anything else I had here. So I, I did want to know, was there any reason that e-bikes were mentioned so infrequently, relatively speaking? I mean, I think uh, I have to think Evan's right. You know, I see many, many more of them from day to day now, and there's all kinds of different flavors and configurations and cargo. Um, and one of my interests here going forward is to talk about how the city can participate in making it even more attractive, whether it's low income assistance to be able to subsidize e-bikes or what, you know, what we can do. I don't want to subsidize e-bikes for people like me because I can afford one, but there are people who would probably take advantage of them if they could. And so is there a reason why? The so maybe I'll respond to the the second part of the question first. Um, in the strategic investment program, Chris mentioned that there's a fair amount of money that's specifically allocated to greenhouse gas reduction and subsidies for e-bikes is one of the things identified in there and that was part of the climate action memo. So is that to study it? So uh, you No, no, to actually provide funding. So that's in the action or electrification. Piece, right, so I looked through that, I didn't catch it, but so are you saying that there is already a program in place or there will be a program thinking about and was it in the short, medium or long term? Ooh, that I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, if we're gonna move forward, it would need to happen fairly quickly. And that is, I think as staff, we would agree that um, we see a lot of e-bikes. I mean, I think I personally know a lot of people <coughs> that are making trips by bike that were not bike riders because of e-bikes, so we certainly see it as a real game changer and in support of it. Okay, I, I guess I just would love to see that called out a little bit as a, a highlight if you, if you mm -hmm. agree. Sure, yeah, we can definitely do that. And I think the other thing we can clarify is when we're talking about bikes in general, we're including you know, traditional bikes as well as, mm -hmm. as e-bikes in terms of the infrastructure and things like that. But we can certainly call out more on you know, e-bikes in particular, and then just to clarify on the action item, it would require additional funding to be able to offer the subsidy program, the local subsidy program for e-bikes in the community. So it's shown in that strategic investment program, and that's that green bubble area that would, are the things, the types of things we'd like to do if we were able to get some additional funding. Got it. Well, we should talk about this during the budget because I don't think it would take an enormous amount of funding to have a pretty big impact because of the cost of the e-bikes has come down so much and, you know, a subsidy is only a portion of that. So um, anyway, I just well, was What about bulk purchasing? Bulk purchases. There you go. Right. Sure. Okay. We could do that. And just to, I wanted to follow up on the question about where in the document the um, investment um, policies and principles are. It, it's in the TMP plan document itself and it's in the plan, it's page 52 and page 53, um, that section. I'm not sure how that adds up to your page numbers in the packet, but it's, I'm? it's in, there's a section on uh, funding the transportation system funding and it's included in that, okay. that section. Okay, I have some so questions. That's, on that's 349 in your packet, at least according to my numbers. So I had two questions and then we'll go to you. That, does that work? Mine and mine is different from kind of from these. So if you want to, okay. So um, two questions. W one is, um, what does it mean to explore the twenty mile per hour suggestion, and what would it mean if we had used a stronger verb? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the idea that we would lower all speed limits on local roadways is um, certainly something that is uh, impactful and would be felt by most members of our community. So I would say part of that means that we're gonna conduct a public process consistent with our public policy guidelines to ensure that we're getting 
feedback from the entire community about what their thoughts are about that. To do that, we would also want to make sure that we're providing to them and to you um, good data on um, what this would mean, um, what, what would be the effect of lowering speed limits. Um, do we think it would be effective? Do, has it been effective in other communities? Are there other impacts that come from lowering speed limits? What have other communities found about that? So it involves research into um, other communities and the studies that have been done there, as well as looking at our own crash data um, and uh, effectiveness data, uh, of which we have quite a bit. We would want to package that all together um, along with the feedback that we get from the community so that we could have an informed conversation with you and you could make an informed decision about whether this would be a good thing to do. Um, I guess I'm curious about where it falls in the timing or the prioritization. Yeah, so we're, we're committed to be moving on it pretty much immediately where um, Kathleen and I will be scoping what that, um, that process looks like this year. And then in your budget um, that you'll be reviewing on October 1st, or, or have already been reviewing, um, there is a new position that we are seeking, a Vision Zero engineer, and that person would take on this task immediately uh, to, to do this evaluation. So, so was that part, if I saw correctly, <clears throat> from 2018 to 2019, Vision Zero budget went from 650 to 550. Was that, did I read that right? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So we're going to be adding another Vision Zero engineer and cutting $100,000 from the Vision Zero budget? We're gonna be adding a Vision Zero engineer. Um, so the and decrease was because of capital, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Direct costs. D so I understood direct costs yeah. included personnel in there as well. Actually, that doesn't. So there would be another $130,000 that would go into 2020 that would be associated with that position if it's, if it's passed in the budget. Um, that uh, 550 represents um, the uh, $200,000 that are um, tied directly to, to Vision Zero. We have a Vision Zero budget, used to be uh, innovations budget, and we've repurposed it to be Vision Zero budget. It includes capital dollars that we have allocated to specific Vision Zero tasks, um, and then it in, uh, includes the $250,000 of the Neighborhood Speed Management Program but it doesn't include that position. So were that to pass, that would actually be uh, 680,000. Okay, D did you have a question on this or? I was just gonna suggest that to get community feedback, you could just have everyone raise their hands who thinks this is a bad idea because we've gotten. I was gonna say good idea. I was, <laughs> I was gonna say because all of the, I think just across the board, what we've gotten is that this is a great idea it's in terms of the safety aspect of it, in terms of emails. Okay. So I, I was just right, I commenting. Just, yeah, facetious. It makes sense that we have a deliberate public process. Okay. But that it's quick. This Deliberate but quick. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have other? You were. I do have another. I have a couple we'll of questions. Um, one is on page page two hundred and eighty, which is about transportation impacts being mitigated. The city will ensure transportation or traffic impacts from a proposed development that cause unacceptable transportation or environmental impacts or parking impacts to surrounding areas will be mitigated, et cetera. I'm asking how you're gonna do this, and I'm thinking specifically of 311 Mapleton, for example, and seeing these big trucks as I have on some of, on 9th Street, and uh, whoever was talking, was it Evan, about the, the exponential cost to the roadway of these heavier trucks than cars? as in buses, Sam, I think he was quoting you. Hmm. So I just wondered how you were gonna go about doing that, when that would happen. Alpine Balsam would be another one. So um, there's a couple um, 
layers to that, that question. So currently we have um, traffic impact studies that are done for new development and as part of that we do require uh, transportation demand management plans for each of those developments and it includes offering eco passes for example for the first three years. One of the things we're recommending that moves forward from this planning process is reviewing the development construction standards for transportation impact studies and looking at how we could um, refine those, update those, and um, look at different ways that we can make sure that we are capturing all the potential impacts from a project as part of that analysis process. So that part of the DCS um, development construction standards review is a work program item that we're currently working on and we'll be bringing forward. It, again, it's transportation as well as the planning development um, staff um, together um, moving forward into the new year. So that is one of the projects we'll Thank work you. on. Thank you, that's helpful because it's, right, it's not the after the fact, but it's before and during the fact. Right. So that, for example, taking down air quality is has been a big one, I know, with the folks um, yep. because of the school at 9th and Mapleton. So um, the only other well thing I would, people. I apologize, the only other thing I would add is that um, the city is also receiving transportation excise tax funding from new development. That money is specifically supposed to be used to um, build improvements um, that are away from their site, but that are probably caused by increased traffic from development. Um, and I, again, I'm thinking specifically of construction. Con what's happening during the construction, right. destruction, and then construction oh. the process itself with the big trucks, oh, the impacts air Impacts that are occurring during construction, not as exactly. a result of redevelopment. Exactly. Oh. But but the before and during as well, because those are things that have been brought up in, in different neighborhoods, yeah. and one can see it on the ground. Um, so <clears throat> for what it's worth, I've been able to review the draft plan, mm -hmm. and they have a pretty strict traffic management plan. It will not go down Mapleton. Neither trucks going inbound or outbound will go past Mapleton. So that was apparently addressed. Past the school, you mean? Yeah, it won't go yeah. past the school. So, but it will still be going, having impacts on those streets that weren't designed to correct. be carrying that that's kind correct. of traffic. Yeah. yeah. So that, and that's what I'm concerned about, that the, we don't get the wider community doesn't get left picking up those costs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you done with your question? And just one other thing, which is that in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan piece of it, um, where you address transportation, you talk about a safe, accessible, and sustainable multimodal transportation system connecting people with each other and where they want to go, and then it goes into the transportation system. It used to be people and goods, and we have referenced goods a little bit up here in terms of cargo and carrying things and the curbside management, offloading trucks, et cetera. Is it, was that taken out as, as part of the, in, for a reason or just? not put in or? And, and Randall, you can help me with this one, but it, it wasn't intentionally taken out to you know not include goods, but it was just a recognition of what we were hearing about the importance of how we travel is how we connect together as a community from person to person, as well as going from place to place. So there wasn't any um, overt reason to remove goods. If that would be helpful to keep that in the, the vision statement, we, we could it's, certainly do it, that. It just seems it's still a big piece of what happens on the ground and um, and it's an important piece of what happens on the ground as well, just in terms of plain old supplies to a community. Mm -hmm. But maybe other council members. You're talking about the vision statement? The Well, what I'm talking about what they want to put. This is in, um, this is on page 531. The Boulder Valley comp plan the comp summary. Plan, so it's what would go in the comp plan, and I was just thinking if it was larger rather than just to people, that it would make more, makes more sense to me. I got a new computer, I don't know how it works. Yeah. And maybe you have some thoughts about that, the transportation <laughs> people or the, uh, yeah. Yeah. yes? So, and, and Randall, I'm just looking at you because you're the most familiar with how we did this to, we wanted to make sure everything we were bringing forward is in alignment with the comp plan mm -hmm. um, update. And so that was also part of the, the wording that we used. But we can certainly incorporate the goods movement in the information. Unless anyone has great, great problems with it. So can you be, uh, 
Cindy, where exactly are you thinking about putting that in the complaints? Well, somewhere just in the, which you said five pages, so 530. I'm on page 531. It's page 31 of the second part of our mm -hmm. packet. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm having trouble following those page numbers, but uh, I think it's the attachment E. Attachment E. Is the yes, it is, yes. it is. The summary for the Boulder Valley comp plan, which we're also being asked to adopt as well as the TMP. Yep. So I was just thinking since it's the comprehensive plan that it would be, it's a broader piece and should speak to those kinds of things. And I see the transportation people nodding. I yep. would hope that the council wouldn't find that objectionable. Well, again, I'm just trying to get a sense so of specifically would, what you're proposing. I'm proposing that, for example, in the sentence where it says, and this could be reworked, wordsmithed it by someone else, I'm not, have a safe, accessible, and sustainable multimodal transportation system connecting people, and I just put in goods, um, not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily Wait, Connecting make, people and transporting goods. And transporting goods, but the with each other and where they want to go would have to be reworked in there. Just putting goods in there somewhere, I don't need to do it right here. And I, yeah, but if I, mean, it, I guess, I mean, I guess it, that, I mean, it's the, the it's, it's kind of the vision statement of the whole master plan, which, and I feel like the vision statement really should be more around um, people rather than freight. Well, I think freight is part of our, we're, we do have commerce in the city and that's part of what commerce is all about. So, and this is the transportation master plan, not the people's <laughs> master plan although it is for the people of Boulder, but it, commerce is a big part of that. So, so I mean, I, I'm just bringing it up. I don't, you know, I, I, you wanna do it. I often move goods when I move around in any mode, right? Sure. It's a lot of times to go pick things up. So I wouldn't have any objection to having staff go figure out how to wordsmith it. But with, but maybe I guess if it's a division statement, we probably have to get it right here. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just wonder if you could get it somewhere in the summary that's not the division statement. I just, you it could it maybe go somewhere a little later in the summary. Um, I just, it was just the concreteness of it. I mean, I like the touchy-feely of the people connecting with people, but then there's just the concrete part too. And it can be somewhere else, I mean. Okay, so I'll include it, but somewhere else. Okay, okay. Um, we have Mary and then Sam, and then we're going to give our comments. So, um, so excuse me if I missed it, but um, where in the process, the plan, um, or the memo, um, was there um, consideration of people who are coming in um, and work um, shift jobs, night jobs, restaurant jobs, the service workers that aren't gonna be commuting by bus, aren't gonna be commuting by e-bike, aren't gonna be commuting by scooter, where, where in the plan do we consider um, these folks? Yeah, so in the action plan, I think you'd probably find most of that. So we talk about the need to increase uh, carpooling, real-time carpool, or real-time car matching, uh, van pooling, you know, recognizing that, yeah, transit service may not reach those people, may not uh, serve the hours that they need to work but recognizing that you need to have that full range of options. Yeah, and recognizing that some of these folks are just gonna be driving alone um, because of their hours and because of the distance they may be traveling and because they may not have somebody they can carpool with or van pool with. So where in the plan do we consider that? One of our objectives, um, our objectives, one of our um, goals is, is uh, our measurable objectives is um, travel time. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's in there is not to say that we're to be building capacity for more um, people to move around in cars. It's an acknowledgement that um, this plan has always been in part about managing our congestion and managing our congestion in a different way than many other communities do by trying to manage it from a demand standpoint rather than supply standpoint and so it would be our by tracking travel time we're tracking that congestion and and the plan is that as we are successful in getting more people to use other modes of transportation at different times that congestion will go down it will 
And, and I think that that would speak to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I just don't know that there's a whole lot of congestion at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, so I guess to piggyback on that, I think the other piece, and we were just talking about, it goes to the back to the investment conversation, and a, a vast majority of the funds that we invest is maintaining the system f for everyone who uses the street, including people who drive. And so, having a safe, uh, you know, a street that is well maintained, that is snow plowed. Um, is swept, it has all of those maintenance components with it, that helps facilitate for mm -hmm. people who are needing to drive in um, for jobs, for school, for medical, whatever it may be. So it, it taking care of the system is a place where we create investment that serves people using all modes of transportation locally and, and regionally. So thank you. Thanks. Sam? So I'm on packet page 349. And I'm taking a look at the different types of, of paths and bike lanes and green streets and multi-use path and so on. And I, I saw a few things that puzzled me. Um, and I just wanted to ask about it. So 55th shows a multi-use path or separated bike lane. But I don't recall one of those anywhere. I mean, there's a sidewalk, um, but I don't believe it's marked as a multi-use path. And then there's bike lanes on both sides of 55th, right near Central. Is there a... It's existing and proposed combined. Oh, existing yeah, and proposed yeah. combined. Ah, I apologize. So there's a proposed um, separated path on 55th. Sorry, okay. here you got up to answer a question. No, that, that, Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, so then the one other question I have is, yes, there are such things along Arapahoe 28th and 30th, um, but they're awfully hard to use very well because of all the curb cuts and the cars and, and all of that. So one other thing I would ask about that subject is for those, and, and South Boulder's another one, right? There's one on one side of a street, it's got two-way traffic on it, drivers just don't look, you, no matter if it says two-way traffic, they're still looking the wrong way, and it's dangerous. And so I'm curious if part of this plan is to do anything to try and make that curb cut problem better on these major arterials. I'll, I'll take it, this first, and again, there's a lot of people who've worked on these. So some of the corridors that you mentioned, for example, Arapahoe and 30th, they do have very specific corridor plans for um, how to redesign and enhance the bike facilities and sidewalk facilities and access to transit. Um, and in addition to that, for example, on Arapahoe, there's a recommendation in the action plan to do an access control plan. And so how do we look at, as we move forward with regional bus rapid transit and bike and pedestrian roadway improvements, how do we look at the opportunity to consolidate driveways and do that as part of um, infill and re redevelopment along East Arapahoe. So that's an example of how that comes forward um, through the planning process and then it ends up integrated into this plan and into the um, implementation um, investment programs. So, and we've done similar projects along uh, corridor plans for uh, 30th Street and for Colorado um, and then for Canyon, those were the Plan, corridor plans that came out of the last TMP. As the corridor plans recommended in this project or this plan include, for example, um, South Broadway that we heard about tonight because of all the concerns that are out there and how do we enhance the, the walking, bicycle, and um, transit and roadway components of, of that corridor as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, let our commenting begin. Bob. I'm going to say three things. Um, I guess four things. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the fact that there was a, a very large pedestrian component of this plan. I think although these plans have been worked on and adopted and revised over 30 years, I'm going to guess that this plan has the biggest pedestrian component ever in history. And I um, had the pleasure of interacting with the pedestrian advisory committee and led by Amy. And as a matter of fact, one of them gave me this. Boulder Walks hat when I walked in, so I'm going to wear it for the rest of the meeting. And so I really think that um, that's super, super important because everyone walks, right? Everyone walks. We need to make that safe. So thank you for that. Second, um, I think I'm hearing two themes, two big themes coming out of this 
master plan, and that's safety and, f and funding, right? And, um, and, and of course, funding can equal safety, right? And I'm just gonna make a, a, a point on, on, on a relatively small example, but it's kind of an important one for me, I guess. Um, if you're out and about, um, if you're in a car and you hit a pothole, it's annoying. If you're in a bike or a scooter and you hit a pothole, it's deadly. I mean, it's, and I spend half my time running, riding around looking down, not looking up, because I'm dodging potholes. And um, so I don't think, you know, whether it's replacing streets or patching potholes, I, I think um, street maintenance is gonna be really, really crucial, not only to the comfort and convenience of people, but also for the for folks' safety. So I know this will be a discussion we'll have next year. Um, I'm fully supportive of funding um, our, um, our maintenance of our roads, and I, and I hope that the next council will do that. And speaking of the next council, my final point is, um, I wanna talk about 20 years plenty. Um, Mike, I really appreciate you coming out and sharing your story of your daughter. I'm, I'm sure that was probably pretty tough. Um, I, I think we can overthink this. Um, I've been uh, fighting with staff for four years on this. And um, I like Cindy's idea. Let's have everybody in town who's against this raise their hand. And we can, we can have all sorts of of, of analysis and evaluation about whether it makes a difference. It does make a difference. Here's the stats. If you get hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, when you're a pedestrian or a bike, um, you have a nine out of 10 chance of surviving. If you get by, hit by a car at 30 miles an hour, your chances go from one out of 10 of death to nine out of 10. It's a huge difference, okay? So if we save one life by doing this, it's worthwhile. So I really hope that, um, that the next council, whoever's on it, will take this up. I, you know, New York did this a few years ago. New York City did. And they, I think they implemented it in 2014. Last year, they reported their traffic fatalities, and they've been keeping track of traffic fatalities in New York City since 1910. Last year, they had their lowest level since 1910. They broke all the records, okay? is worth doing, they save, they've saved a lot of lives in New York and we save lives here, so I, I, I think we can overthink this. I think the next council should um, accelerate this and take this on, and what better year for 20 is plenty than 2020. <laughs> Sam. So thank you staff for putting this together. Thank you, Tab, for all your work on this. Um, this is a really good looking <clears throat> um, set of, of both assessments as well as um, plans going forward. I'm gonna jump on Bob's point, um, but slightly differently. I agree with 20 is plenty. I mean, I, I feel like it's time to do this. We can see that crashes because of speeding have been going up every year for the last four years. And that means that more people are speeding. You can see the number of citations and the number of run red lights. It's a real problem and you can feel it changing. I mean, the more you are on pedestrian or on a bike, you can feel people driving differently. They're more distracted and they're going faster. <clears throat> and that is a very bad combination. I do think we have to honor the public process. So maybe it's the first thing that gets taken up next year. But you know, we have seen what happens when we don't honor public process and give people their chance to weigh in, even, no matter how I might feel. So I would say both things are true. I'm probably gonna support it unless there's something really surprising I don't know. But I also think we have to plan on the public process being solid because we get better buy-in then and when we get better buy-in, it's a durable policy that lasts for a long time. So I think both things are true. Um, my biggest takeaway is I don't think we're funding safety enough. Now, it could be some safety is in potholes and you know having roads in good repair, but I really feel like if we're serious about Vision Zero, it's gotta be robustly funded. And so this is a budget conversation to have, but I really, really believe that these crashes cost our community a lot of money. You know, $100 million of societal cost. If we could cut half of that out, it would be worth a few million dollars to do cutting that out if we get that kind of leverage. And so I really wanna understand the cost benefit. That's why that number jumped out at me right away. So I also go look at the crash maps and they're very well done and very interesting. And you can see the same intersections that are bad for pedestrians, 
They're bad for autos and autos, and they're bad for autos and bikes, okay? And so 30th is a problem. Arapaho is a problem. You know, you, you just don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure it out. For pedestrians, Canyon is a problem. I mean, Canyon and 15th and Canyon and Folsom are big hitters here for pedestrian crashes. And Alpine and Balsam, I that one. I know, uh, that was yeah. north, <laughs> north, north, and, north, and north and Broadway, yeah, it was surprising. Bike crashes, Arapaho and 30th, you know, these these are very, Colorado and 30th. So, so, I mean, I really feel like these places where we have lots of crashes need to be a focus, and they need to be a focus in the near term, not the long term, and we are doing some things. I mean, I think uh, the crossing, at Colorado and um, 30th, sh hopefully will help a lot. But, you know. The underpass. The underpasses, yeah, the two underpasses. But when you're on a bike in the gutter pan on Folsom, it is scary. When you're in the gutter pan of 30th, it is scary. You know, we and so I just avoid 30th like the plague if I can, but you can't always do that, and Folsom similarly. So these bike lanes with half of it being the gutter pan, is pushing bikers out into traffic. And so I don't know what can be done in the near term about that. I don't know if anything can be. But, I mean, that's where... Plungers. I, yeah, plungers. <laughs> 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 that's where I think people feel most exposed, and it's where we're getting the least buy-in from inexperienced bikers being able to share the road with automobiles. So. That was a big takeaway. We have all the data we need to have this conversation in the next council about 20 is plenty, but also about, you know, are our priorities right? Are we focusing really hard on where we know the dangers are? I, on page, just around this, on page 405 of the packet, there's a treatment column, and it says, protected bicycle lanes, protected intersections, neighborhood speed management program. Then it says, to be implemented and studied. Hang on, we ran a bunch of pilot programs on different bike lane configurations and figured out what worked and what didn't work. Um, and, and we have a neighborhood speed management program and we're building a protected intersection. So what, what's to study at this point about those? I mean, I just think implementation is what we need here. It's evaluation. It's evaluation. Yeah. Okay, I would I would change that language then because it, yeah, it sounds like we haven't done anything on this so far and we don't know anything and we're just going to try implement it. Implement and evaluate. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I guess that's the end of my comments, but as you can tell, I, I really feel like safety needs to be at the very top and that can include things like plowing and patching potholes, but it also needs to improve the treatments that pedestrians and bikes have relative to the cars. So thanks for doing this. Mary, and then Aaron, and then Cindy. So I'll agree with um, with Bob and um, Sam in terms of the 20 uh, speed limit. I think that um, one of the things and pieces of information that we received from, um, from community cycles was that even though compliance goes down when you lower the speed limit, that it still um, nets a slower speed. Um, and that this, this 20 mile per hour is best done in um, conjunction with other um, street treatments. But nevertheless, just lowering the speed limit is still, um, still nets a benefit. So um, I, think, I think we need to really put that at the top of our outreach um, plan as well, as well as the, the intersections with high crashes. Um, I, um, and then, you know, as far as the whole um, issue with um, the funding, I, I, I want to put it out there to my colleagues who are going to be here. <laughs> um, Bob and Aaron, I'm sure you will. Um, to really take a deep dive into the budget and make that a work plan item and take a look at every, at our budget in a holistic manner so that we're not just making decisions for transportation, um, so that we're looking at it completely and um, and and holistically and equitably. So um, that's how I would like to address the funding. Um, 
With respect to um, the um, equity tool that's being used, um, I really appreciate that equity is a priority of this plan. Um, I do think that the tool that's being used could be um, improved in a way um, where the under equity, um, there's, there's a composite that consists of poverty level, car-free households, population under 17 or over 65, non-white households and households with a disability. I think that those could probably be broken out um, separately because if, if a car-free household is not necessarily, um, it, it may be a choice because they are by population density and next to mobility hubs and they have eco-passes. So I don't know that that would necessarily um, um, benefit, that people living in that, those circumstances would necessarily benefit as much as if it was um, somebody in poverty level um, intersecting with over 65, intersecting with a disability and um, far away from a mobility hub. So I, I think that that's how we need to look at it. We need to look at it, um, that particular one broken out, um, decoupled, so that you break out all those elements that are within that equity piece and look at the tool a little differently. I, I do think that that tool can be improved um, and maybe there's other models out there from other places that have broken things out and look at the intersectionality of, um, of these different situations. And, um, and then thirdly, I would like us to kind of think about expanding the we. You know, we, we talk a lot about our transportation um, efforts in terms of, um, of e-bikes, of commuters, and you know, nine to five folks. And I think we need to start thinking about people that provide some really essential services to our community people that work in the restaurants that are probably driving in from far away, and, um, and we couldn't do without them. And I think we need to start thinking about them. So I think we need to expand the we and include the people who are the shift workers and the service workers and you know the nurses' aides that work at the hospital in shifts. And so um, I think you probably put that somewhere in, in um, in that comp plan um, piece of it. So um, I think that's all I have. So thank you for a great job. Aaron. Well, I'll start with a, a quick gush because I think you all have done an amazing job. I think the, I, the focus on pedestrians and finally getting the low stress walk and bike network put together, I think it, it looks really impressive. I can't wait for all the implementation over the next 10, 20 years, it's gonna be great. The action item list is very long and very, very good. Um, and, so, and big thanks to the Transportation Advisory Board members and the pedestrian um, group as well. Everybody worked super hard, so thank you. I'm super excited about this. Um, just a few things, um, just to uh, echo some of my colleagues' comments. Um, so I, I really appreciate the equity focus on new transportation projects, so I think that's a really positive development. And I think Mary made some great points about how that could, tool could be done better. So thank you for that, Mary, but I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. Um, I, I agree on the, the, the 20 is plenty. Uh, we'll be seeing 2020 and, and 2020 <laughs> on 20 is plenty. Um, that was a slogan, I just I just coined it. Um, but I agree, we do need some public plagiarized. process, right? You, you can't, what's that? yeah. You plagiarized. <laughs> um, but we do need some public Sorry. process. We can't just Bob. do the, we shouldn't just do this by fiat in, in a week. But um, I'd, I'd look to the next council to put it on the work plan and, and really make it happen. Uh, the, uh, I also agree about the um, need for additional funding on safety issues. And so I think we can talk more about that in the budget process. But we do need to do the deep dive and figure out how we can do better funding on safety issues and agree with Bob about that needs to include the, the uh, pavement management. Um, somebody sent me some pictures of some streets up in the Chautauqua area y yesterday and just some streets that are just falling apart and I think we can all think of a few um, that are just, uh, have gotten in really, really terrible shape and, 
and uh, just if we can move the needle on those, I get that we're about at our 75 metric, because it's 70, you know, but, but we can hit that metric and still have some streets that are just totally unacceptable. And so if we can think about ways to, to adjust that, um, I think it's, it's better for all all transportation users. Or if we're purposely waiting to let people know that. Right, and there may be that every single one of the ones that are in really terrible sh shape are gonna get done in a year or two because of some other thing. Maybe that's the case, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I suspect probably not for all of them. A um, Couple of uh, specific things. Um, so the green streets, I'm really excited about the green streets. Um, I do feel like they need uh, some additional um, en engineering treatments. I, I think like the 13th Street one seems to be pretty much entirely about paint uh, and some stop signs. And 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 I get that it's, uh, you know, putting in some curb bulb outs or, or, or things like that is more expensive and it would limit our ability to do more of them. But um, I just, I really feel like they need to be more than just paint. And and so I, I there was the, the language, it was like in our packet, page 299 on Green Streets, like specifically uh, mentions paint and, and not, um, uh, it's in designing a low-stress walk and bike network. So, like my my one kind of specific thing for change there is in the neighborhood Green Street is to maybe mention more than just paint striping and roadway repair, but the possibility of additional um, engineering treatments in that description for Green Streets because I'd love to see them that program be a little bit more robust in what it implements. Um, and then one super detailed one I, I noticed that in the action item there was. Uh, about integrating with the Bustang, the CDOT's uh, regional bus service that they're doing. And um, one thing, they are actually going th uh, through town now to Estes Park and up to Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so if we could include in there the advocacy for local stops on the Bustang routes where, uh, where possible, because uh, I'd love to see us uh, get one in the town and if any others go through Boulder that they have a stop for Boulder. Can I just colloquy a little bit on the paint part? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we might be underestimating the paint a little bit. Um, I did stand at the corner of 13th and Alpine because that corner is just notoriously bad. And uh, right after the paint went in, and I and since then, I'll stand there and I'll watch bikes and cars follow the paint around, and it's made a huge difference. So, um, yeah, um, let's not underestimate the power of paint. Thank you for that, Mary. <laughs> and I do not mean to say that the paint is not worthwhile. I think the 13th Street Green Street is great. I'm just saying that I'd love to see a little more, too. Cindy. So, interestingly, 13th Street was the first street that the, I don't know if it was the original transportation plan, but it was designated way back when as the alternate bike route for Broadway. So it has long history of being that, and the addition of paint is undoubtedly a great one. Um, and I agree with what Bob has said with his 20 is plenty and 20. Um, I, it's time to do that, and I'd also like to see the next council look at the 15 miles per hour in the speed zones. The father who came in and spoke to us about the reality of the difference that that could have made in his life um, and others, because they're not only the money costs that Sam was mentioning, but they're also the human costs, the grief that goes with accidents. Um, the potholes and the safety issues that Bob talked about, I know of a couple of brain injury cases that were brought to the city because of potholes on major streets. There have probably been a lot more since then. So there, there's, as well, they're a safety issue. It's not just a convenience issue, and particularly for those people who are biking or walking at nighttime. Um, so I think it's a really great effort, and applaud all of you. I know so many people have been working in it, on it, and it's come to us many times, and I'm happy to see that uh, the issue of safety first has come to the fore with the speeding and the traffic just the way it goes um, more quickly these days. One of the things I was going to say, though, in terms of costs and paying for it is that we always look to the budget, and it seems to me that we could look to some of the persons, corporations, entities that bring all of these additional people in and see if there isn't a way. This, these things have been worked out in places like Santa Clara County, California, 
so that they're outside parts that can also play their part in paying for some of the impacts that they have caused. And so I would hope that we would look at those and not always look at our budget first. I know Jane would appreciate that. <laughs> <You're right>. um, <laughs> and, and there are opportunities out there. They've been done in other places. We just need to take them up. So, but thank you everyone um, who has participated. I think it's really a good move. It was a beautiful document. Um, I'm still gonna gush, but Mirabai, did you wanna say anything? It's pretty much all been said by my colleagues. I'll agree with Cindy in the budget. Um, I think that I agree with the 2020 and the public process still needs to happen, but I think it's pretty obvious. Um, I will say, I, I kind of will chime in with Mary on the equity. There are people that need to drive, and I think some of the reasons we're probably seeing higher speeds and more agitation is because of the congestion. Um, I know that it exists for myself when I drive. Um, and so I just would like to remember that there is that factor. People, the town was built around cars, unfortunately, and that's just the case. So, um, but I do appreciate all the work that went into this. I'm sure it was mind boggling the hours. So thank you and thanks for taking the community um, and our safety into account. Okay, let me back clean up up here. I will agree with my colleagues on the safety part. I think that has definitely been a theme. Um, I, I'm all in for the 20 miles per hour, and I actually think that we might want to selectively do the, the 15 miles per hour in school zones, especially, and maybe it's um, site specific. There are some neighborhoods that are buried in safer places than others. Um, but anyhow, I, I would go there. Um, I think also what was said about spending a little bit more on safety, I think especially if we can figure out, if we can target the intersections which we know are problems, it's worth spending sooner to fix those if we can. And they're pretty obvious and you listed them. A um, Couple other things that we haven't talked about, um, so I'm just gonna mention it is, um, uh, the model is bus rapid transit that we have on US 36. That was an effort that took at least two decades and working closely with our regional partners. I don't know who the next mayor will be, but I will tell you that the issue I spend my, most of my time on is representing the city at US 36 Mayors and Commissioners Coalition. Metro Mayors Caucus talks a lot about transportation. There's a State Highway 7 Coalition and there's a State Highway 119 as well. And we spend a lot of time, and so does our staff, and hats up. we have some of the best staff, um, working very closely with staff from other regions to move that forward and then go to DC. That's the other thing, is to go to DC and try to get federal funding for these efforts. Getting those corridors um, complete in terms of bus rapid transit has everything to do with addressing congestion as, as this region grows. Um, so I guess I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, that that's a really big, we haven't talked about it, so I'm just gonna say that's another big piece of this whole transportation um, puzzle, and a lot of effort goes into that. Um, there's been some interesting studies about how to fund that bus rapid transit network, and we've been talking a little bit about how do we fund our local stuff. Well, how do we fund the regional stuff? Um, a, a real challenge, and I'll just note that there's some interesting studies that I hope the next council will get to hear. Um, that RTD actually had somebody do a study on what it would take if we did a county tax to fund Highway, uh, highway 7 bus rapid transit and 119 and um, those priorities, how we might do it. So anyhow, that's more for the next council to unpack, but um, it's key to the looking at this whole, the housing transportation issue holistically and as a region that's a key part of it. Um, so I just wanna underscore that. And this, it's buried, it's not buried in the plan, it's in the plan, we just haven't talked about it, but it's a really important part. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is figuring out the RTD piece and pursuing the hop model I think is key. Um, and with that, the whole EcoPass issue and just figuring out how to make it easy to take transit along with doing the low stress bike white, um, walk network will be key to I think our future and reducing the congestion so the people that do have to drive 
it, so it works better. So I just want to underscore that is really important. We haven't talked at all about electrification. Um, I, I, given the hour, I'm not going to ask it, but I hope our, we're progressing well in terms of pr electrifying our fleet and figuring out through you know bulk purchasing how to make it more accessible to our public, whether it's buying e-vehicles or e-bikes. Um, because that is a big part of us making the climate. We haven't talked a lot about the climate aspects of the tra transportation master plan, but that also is really key. It's just that safety is, is the topic of the day, and that's fine. But those elements, I think, are really key to going forward. Um, and I think it's been said, um, but I do think we learned some important lessons from Folsom, and now we need to free ourselves to be um, bold and innovative again. And I think we need to do our homework, we need to do good public process, but we also need to be bold again. And so I think this plan sets us up really well for that. Um, and I hope the next council has some vim and vigor on this issue. Um, I'll also, just one last final thing is, um, some things have been said about being creative as we look at these development projects about one earths and car free areas. And I think there's some room for some of that as well um, as we create great places. Um, so um, I'll leave it there. I think everybody said this is a beautiful, readable, amazing plan. I'm sure we're gonna get awards around the country for it. I'll be happy to, well, I guess I only get to carry it forth um, outside of our borders, but um, I think there's a lot to brag about in this. Um, so thank you. And thank you to TAB, and thank you to the pedestrian group. And I know some of that will continue forward, um, and it'll be really important to implementation. So, sorry, that was a long speech. I don't get to have make so many more of those, so. <laughs> Anything else? Maybe you should make a motion. Make a motion. I would like to make a motion that we accept the 2019 Transportation Master Plan, the Action Plan, the Vision Zero Boulder Safe Streets Report, the Vision Zero Action Plan, and the Boulder Pedestrian Plan um, as contained in our packet. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we get to vote? Yes, we do. Is, all those in favor? It is unanimous. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, 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 wait. One more. No, wait. Who wants this one? Uh, I move that we accept the revised transportation master plan summary for inclusion in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as contained in attachment E. Second. With, with we hope, a little bit of freight. words. Put some freight in there. Yes. Yeah, okay. put some freight in there. Get some goods. All right, all those in favor? It is unanimous. All right. Okay, any process discussion before we adjourn? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. We are adjourned. Um, I went over and did this. Live from Paris, on France 24.